Coming up on today's episode, scientists find a whole new class of fundamental particles. That's fun. Model Y rear wheel drive is on the way, coming much sooner than we thought. And hey, a little bit of a 2020 uh, year in review, because that's the end of the year. So we're going to look back. Let's get ludicrous. Hey there, and welcome to Our Ludicrous Future. This is the podcast where we talk about all the cool future stuff that's going to happen tomorrow that's going to make today the thing that's totally ludicrous. Bam. Uh, I'm Joe Scott with the Answers of Joe YouTube channel. Uh, with me is Ben Sullins. Hey, guys. It's uh, Ben Sullins from the interwebs and the planets the of Sullen. Earth. How are y'all doing? Um, special episode today. We're going to be looking back at 2020. Timothy is not with us, but he will be calling in from his travels around the globe. You know, or part of the globe, I guess. And uh, Just as, through Texas, practically yeah, the globe. Practically the size of a globe. With us, as always, are our Discord cats and kittens. How are you guys doing today? <laughs> They're submitting questions <laughs> and asking. So if we have a bunch of random topics for you later, it's their fault. And if you want to be part of the reason that we have these, the, the fault that is, uh, you can learn more and uh, sign up and join the community here at olfpod.com slash Patreon. And uh, you'll be able to listen and watch live and just, you know, chat with us kind of more behind the scenes that we do before we get hit the record button here. So it's to all to be clear. There's, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of fault to go around for what's about to happen in this episode. It's uh, mm -hmm. it's going to be mm -hmm. a very uh, booyah base kind of mix of stuff. Booya or booya? I think booya. Booya base. base. <laughs> and and Joe, I mean, it's we're not there yet, but. Uh, we're going to see that silver plaque turn to a gold plaque in your background pretty soon. Sounds like uh, it's going to happen, maybe. Uh, maybe in the next week or so. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. I'm stoked. I, for you. I do have, uh, I shouldn't, I shouldn't uh, spoil this too much, but I do have a little bit of a celebratory video or a milestone acknowledging video anyway that uh, uh, it took me a long time to get started on because of just stuff going on. And so I was kind of happy when my subscriber growth actually slowed down quite a bit in the uh -huh. last month because I, I needed the extra time. Nice. But, um, yeah, it's probably in the next week or so. Yeah, so what do you have now? 996,000 last time I looked? I think it crossed in 97 last yeah, night. Yeah, look at that. And, and, and back when we first started becoming, became YouTube friends, I think you were at 80,000 subscribers and I was at <laughs> 40,000. And that wasn't wow. that long ago, man. That was like a couple years ago. I think you had just done the YouTube Next Up thing. So that'll be 2016. Oh wow! Have we That's known each other that cool. long? I think so. It must be. That, that was the you, fall of 2016. I, I remember you were like wearing your hoodie on it or something, and I was like, "Oh hey, yeah." So, you know the, what sucks? That it, like, so yeah, the, it wasn't a hoodie, but it was like a nice little fleece, you know, warm right. thing. And and it's one of my favorite little toss on in a light light jacket kind of things. But it mm -hmm. says class of 2016 on the back, and it just yeah. that just keeps getting older and older. And <laughs> it's I don't know, it's starting to kind of well, it's literally showing its age. Now but, it's vintage. Uh, yeah, now it's <laughs> yeah. Now it's cool it's again. Retro. It's cool again. Right. Yeah, I have one uh, of those from the Plural Site Author Summit, 2014. I think it was. It was my first one there, <laughs> and it's still like like this big puffy jacket because you know they're based in Utah. So every time we'd come out, they'd uh, give yeah. us all these jackets. So I have like a whole closet full of this winter gear, you know, which I can I can definitely use because it gets below 60 <laughs> degrees, and I am you know I need the stuff. So, uh, but yeah, every time I put it, on, I'm like, man. Damn, I'm old, I guess. <laughs> it makes you feel old, you know? Like, it feels like that was yesterday, but it was six years ago. Well, it does. Yeah, I mean, you're right, though. Like, I uh, I think about just even a year ago, the channel was about a half a million or so. Yeah. Um, so it's, yeah. When it, Actually, what really always blows my mind is, is, is I left my job of 12 years. I, I kind of had a transition job between the two, um, but it was, I, I took a pay cut. And because I was making just enough from YouTube and, and other things to sort of uh, offset the the loss. But um, when I think about it now, it's like I had, I don't know, 50,000 subscribers and I just like quit my job. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, yes. wow, I can't believe yeah. I did that. Like, it's just the, the balls that I had to do that. I don't, I yeah. don't know that I, I, I didn't know I had it in me, but I guess I did. Or maybe I just hated my job that much. I was just like, get me the hell out of here. Yeah. Well, no, I think my that's... soul isn't worth it. 
I think that's right. It's it's tough, but then when it works out, you you look back like, damn, that was crazy. You know, like when mm-hmm. I quit my, so I was the chief data officer at Pluralsight. We were one of these billion dollar unicorn startup in the tech space. And I was, you know, I started the company when there were 50 people and I left when we were 500 people. And it was just, the, the, it was a rocket ship, you know, and mm. I was poised to make a ton of money and do all the things. And I was just like, yeah, I'm out. You know, <laughs> my my oldest son was uh, six months at the t- six months old at the time, or no, maybe eight months old at the time, something like that. Mm. I just bought a Tesla, you know, so I just bought an expensive car, just had a kid, had this like big, you know, fancy job making all this money. And I'm like, peace done too stressful <laughs> uh um so yeah i don't know that, that, yeah that's even that's even things. a bigger thing when you just have just had a kid yeah, well yeah we like we that's when most people are like i'm never leaving my job now yeah yeah you know it's hard though and i think uh, tim ferris was sort of an inspiration for me mm-hmm. years ago in one of his books he had this whole thing where you do where you do this exercise where you you write down like what's the worst that could happen um, mm. you, you look back and you say, Hey, you know, and, and I think this is, this is a great exercise for people probably this year, uh, looking at, you know, their careers and their jobs and what they wanted to do with their lives and, um, and trying to make that call about like, well, okay, if you didn't have like, almost like if you were forced to find something new, what would you want to be doing? What would you mm-hmm. try to go do? And then if it doesn't work out, what's the worst that could happen? And maybe that's terrible. Maybe the worst that could happen, it's not worth doing. But me and, and my wife, my then girlfriend and you know other friends of ours that have done this, most times when you write down the worst thing that could possibly happen, it's not nearly as bad as like the fear you currently have mm-hmm. about the bad things happening. Yeah. And I don't know. So that that gave me the courage to be like, all right, let's go. Let's try this. And and like bottom line, I go find another job in six months if it doesn't work. Right. And that was for It's funny you bring up Tim ago. Ferriss. I haven't I haven't been following him much lately, but but he was a huge inspiration to me to yeah. to kind of pursue something outside of just a regular nine to five kind of kind of gig. Mm-hmm. Uh him and your buddy Pat Flynn. Yeah. I've I've yeah. been listening to him for years. When I found out you knew him, I was like, Well, that's crazy. Yeah, no, he's uh we were supposed to have coffee last week and then, you know, everything shut down. So, yeah. <laughs> and then thanks to all the, the wonderful strip clubs in San Diego, the, all the stuff is opening again, you know, which I'll give some context here. So that's just, just a weird offhand comment. Yeah. yeah. No, just leave it there. Let's move on. <laughs> uh, the strip club sued the county to stay open because they didn't have data showing that them being open was causing more spread of coronavirus. And, uh, and they won. And, and so... All the restaurants, everything get to reopen. So, there you go. <laughs> that was kind of a random. I was l- last night, like like scrolling through the news. I'm like, what? Am I reading this right? This seems okay. <laughs> and then I'm sure it'll change tomorrow, and everything will have to close down again. But you know, it is what yeah. it is. So, well, uh, I wasn't here last week. Oh, how did how right. did how did things go with with just you and Tim? <sighs> I hear well, he made a lot of mistakes. Yeah. It was great hearing his account of it, and we should get your account of it too. But maybe does Tim have some corrections he wants to share before we move on? Because there were apparently a lot of things he said that were not correct. Not correct as in he didn't know at the time. Not like mm. he intentionally uh, did it. I just know I've been right? uh, misinformed this whole time, so I, I guess I need to get informed. Wait, no. <laughs> yeah, correct re-informed? informed. Yeah, what's the right word? Allow me to reintroduce myself. All right. <laughs> so here we are, Tim. Help us out. Correct us. Hey, guys. Uh, sorry I'm not there with you, but uh, I'm finally making my way home, which <laughs> it feels really good. So uh, I wanted to go ahead and give you guys, first off, uh, a really big correction that I had from last week. I made a huge mistake, and when it finally hit us, uh, everyone that, that helped me shoot uh, on that day, we all 100% thought that serial number eight, sorry, I should back up. I made a huge mistake when I was explaining serial number eight last week. I thought for sure it went super far west, like a substantial amount west, like at least a kilometer west, and then glided in basically from that profile. That is 100% not the case. Once we looked through a bunch of other footage and put it together and then also 
uh, looked at the flight club data and stuff once we were able to correct it with new information. It went virtually straight up. And then we also saw other shots and stuff. We, we 100% know it went straight up, more or less. And I, I don't know if it's... Uh, a few things I think tricked us is uh, the wind direction was blowing. The, there's, there's condensation and venting coming off the vehicle. Uh, that definitely threw it off because it just looked like from our vantage point, like it was going west um, to our right. Um, it also, I'm, I'm trying to still figure out the, the scope. I think our telescope, we might have had it slightly at an angle where at the horizon it looked normal, but then as it went up, it would have slightly been tilted. I, I can't quite figure it out yet, but it, it definitely looks like in the scope, like it was leaning way more and more right. Like we're seeing the one side of it and, and it just made it look like it went right. So um, in the description below, I do have a little update that, that Declan Murphy did talking about how uh, he reworked some of the stuff behind the serial number eight profile. But what we learned, one of the biggest reasons why why Declan, because uh, I was talking a lot with Declan Murphy. So flightclub.io, I should probably explain that real quick. That's the, that's the software that we use, the website that we use, that gives us data on launches. Now, normally when a launch is something that's been done before, like a Starlink launch, his data is literally like down to tenths of seconds accurate because he can look at the data from those missions, plot it on a chart, and then know what is going to happen next time, basically. With serial number eight, we had to take some pretty big assumptions. And of course, those assumptions, in retrospect, were completely wrong. So the first big assumption that we made that was wrong was that they would want to put as little fuel in it as possible and still do this flight profile. We assumed for safety and for FAA certifications and stuff, wrongly so, that they would put as little fuel in as humanly possible uh, just to minimize, you know, minimize risk and make it so there was less potential for a big old boom. Now, come to find out that was 100% not the case. And the other thing we wanted to, that we assumed was that they didn't want to go supersonic either. So that's what made our flight path, uh, our simulation, our data, tell us that it, those were our constraints where, you know, it has three Raptors. It's going to use basically as little fuel as possible safely, I guess, and with some margins, and then uh, that it would not go supersonic. So that gave us actually a pretty narrow window of opportunity. Now, the problem is the assumption that they'd use as little fuel as possible was flat out wrong. That is not what they did. They, they didn't top it off. If you top off a vehicle like seal number eight, all the way full of fuel, it won't get off the pad with three Raptors. There's three Raptors are not nearly powerful enough to do that. Um, now, on the other hand, if you, uh, even, even when they had it, they had it fairly well loaded. Uh, we realized now after some tweets from Elon that it was, it was loaded up pretty good. It was loaded up, uh, more than I thought for sure. Um, and that's why it lumbered off the pad. And even so, I don't, we st and we're looking into the new flight profiles, even after the video that I link in the description, uh, Declan and I are still going through over some stuff there. We actually think they might've been taking off at not even near full throttle and that at no point did any Raptor go full throttle, which is crazy to think. So that's why it just went so slow. It never exceeded a very high uh, velocity vertically, almost at all. Like it just crawled up and then it got to the top and, and just kind of hovered. Uh, according to what we think and uh, from scope data and from all these things. And we called it out even on the live stream. We thought it went down. We definitely think it went down now. We made the assumption that that wouldn't be. The, so we think it's supposed to get up to Apogee um, and then hover there and just wait there until it's to the right fuel depletion and then fall. Um, but it actually definitely went down a little bit. I mean, that could have still been planned too, but it, it might've had something to do with the header tank pressure issue. So Long story short, we got a lot of stuff wrong. Even when I was talking about it the day after, so last week, uh, I still got a lot of stuff wrong because we hadn't really been able to look through all the data yet, comb through all of the variables. And remember, again, all this stuff where we had to do based on observations and just kind of, you know, public information and then tweets from Elon. So that helps give clues to what they actually did in that flight profile. None of us expected that flight profile at all. In retrospect, it would make sense that they would want to go as slow as possible. Like literally go as slow as possible, maintain as much control as possible, and just, you know, not even get to the point if you know if you go supersonic or, or transonic, that transonic region is nasty. Transonic is like kind of between 
80 ish to 110, 120% the speed of local speed of sound. So your altitude and pressure and temperature, all that stuff changes your, your local speed of sound. But what happens is the, the reason it's called transonic region is um, airflow, if it's, you know, going around a curve or if it's hitting a pocket or like a, you know, low spot or something, it, it, the airflow can experience different speeds at different, uh, in different areas at different times. So the vehicle can be experiencing regions like at the tip of the fins where it's, where it's going supersonic, but the body's not yet, or the nose is, has airflow that's portions of it are supersonic and other parts aren't. So that's why they call it the region of transonic. So we, we assume they'd want to avoid that entirely for this so far, just because it, it adds a lot of extra variables. You have to have a lot more like precise aero and flight hardware in that sense. So all of our assumptions that we made last week, you almost need to throw last week's episode out the window uh, because so many assumptions were wrong. Some of the reactions were still correct. Um, I, I think before seal number nine, I might have to just put together a video of what we saw in seal number eight and what, what we can expect for seal number nine, assuming it flies a similar profile. Now, of course, those of you that are listening now probably know last week, um, I, think it was the, I think it was last Friday, um, serial number nine tipped over in the high bay uh, that's pretty much been corrected now. It looks like they're working to get it out to the pad, do a, a few probably extra tweaks and, and checkovers on the pad, uh, probably swap out the fins and the flaps, and then fly it as soon as possible. Now, uh, don't panic. <laughs> just never, just always don't panic. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I'm guessing that still the first flight won't be until next year for sure, until 2021. Um, I think they would like to get it out there as soon as possible, but knowing that they're going to have to do some tweaks and just kind of knowing how these campaigns tend to work out, it'll probably be a while. So I'm guessing at least, you know, January, I, I, I'd be impressed if they flew serial number nine a month after serial number eight, like that'd be huge. Um, I don't quite think that'll happen. I'm guessing it'll be more like middle of January. So yeah, so that's my serial number eight corrections. And uh, whoopsie doodle, I, I def we definitely made some some false assumptions, and and we were tricked visually. We this is the classic like, in hindsight, it's so obvious, but all of us were convinced because of basically optical illusions. And I'm trying to look in our video. A lot of us are looking super far right, like you can see all of us looking to the right. But I don't remember actually seeing it after a certain point in the in the sky. I was just looking at the monitor, and then trying to find it in the sky. So I think it could just be bad memory that we all thought it went west, but it did not. So there you go, corrections for seal number eight. But speaking of uh, space stuff, <laughs> this is a terrible transition. We had some we had some fun news come out of NASA. I think this actually might have been last week already. Like I probably could have talked about it last week because it was December 9th. But whatever, time doesn't exist anymore. So uh, the, the exciting news was that NASA announced uh, the first 18 members uh, potential crew for the Artemis program. So of course, the Artemis program is the return of humans to the moon. Super, super exciting. But the the cool thing is that we actually have names for these people now. And um, th so this was uh, announcement made with with NASA and and Mike Pence made an announcement. The the cool thing is that eight, there's 18 uh, astronaut candidates. Um, nine of them are women. None of them are men, which is awesome. Obviously, that represents the human populace very well. Um, but some some fun thing is we have a few names you might recognize actually in this group. So um, as far as people that I'm very familiar with, um, the Joseph Acaba flew, let's see, a little a while ago. Um, he's performed three spacewalks, maybe not total household name. Almost all these people have flown before. Um, but the one that I'm excited about, um, there is... Uh, Raja uh, Chari, who is actually from Cedar Falls, Iowa, my hometown. Crazy, I don't know him, which is weird because it's a very small town. He is uh, a, a little bit older than me. I think he might even be like almost 10 years older than me. So I, I, I guess that's why I don't know him. But still kind of crazy that from my hometown is an astronaut that might be going to the moon. That's frankly amazing. Um, another name that you should recognize is Victor Glover, who is currently up on station right now with Crew One. Um, he is he is on the list. Um, let's see, Johnny Kim, you might recognize um, as a as a recent astronaut candidate. Um, but then we have Christina Cook, who uh, who holds the record for the longest single space flight by a woman. So you might remember her. Um, she's done three hundred and twenty eight days in space. 
She, uh, yeah, so she's a total, total rock star. Um, Nicole Mann, you might recognize, she's part of, uh, she'll be part of the crew flight test for, for Boeing Starliner. Um, Anne McLean, you definitely should recognize that name. Um, she's definitely been up quite a few times. Uh, I think quite a few times, or I just, maybe not. I just remember her flying. Okay, Jessica Meir uh, is another one that's, that's uh, you might recognize her name. Um, Kate Rubens, you definitely should know, I think. Wait, is Kate up on station right now? Yes, I think. Uh, Jessica Watkins uh, is another one that that is pretty familiar to a few of us, too. So pretty cool group of candidates. Again, there's 18 of them. We're really excited that we actually have the names of people that are looking to go to the moon already in about 2022 for the first Artemis missions. But those are just flybys, which I don't think that will happen. Um, but yeah, they're, that's just really cool to see them actually hashed out. We have some names, we have some people. Um, you guys know, I'm probably not like the best with the astronaut names and the, I, 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 it's weird. My channel's name is everyday astronaut yet. I like almost never once mentioned astronauts and never have interviewed an astronaut and never really talk about the astronauts. So it's definitely not my forte. You guys know I'm very hardware based, uh, but nonetheless, it does get me really excited and I'm gonna try paying a little bit more attention uh, now that we actually have crew in rotation and people literally have their name on a list that are going to the moon. I think that's pretty exciting. So yeah, so that's uh, those are my big news items, big correction and a news item. And, uh, and there you go. Back to you guys. Informed? Wait. <laughs> yeah, Correct informed? informed? Yeah, what's the right word? Allow me to reintroduce myself. All right. <laughs> so here we are, Tim. Help us out. Correct us. Quick Correct record. the record. Set the All record right. straight. So then we can cut over to him, do that. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Tim. That was fantastic. <laughs> now, so, Joe, so what, I, yeah, hit, no, hit ahead, me with your ahead. thoughts on Starship because we didn't get to hear him last week. That's true. Um, so uh i was i was recording something um again i'm i'm being cagey because it's not totally public yet but uh uh yeah I, I was at a studio i was recording something and um i i made everybody stop while the the starship thing happened so I, I literally um i had my computer up and i was recording stuff so i was on camera and i had i had the script on my computer however the fingers work and yep. uh and then like in the window below it i had the 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 video kind of muted but i could see the time ticking down you know mm -hmm. and uh and so when it got down to like a minute or so i was like okay we're done i gotta stop <laughs> so we just stopped and everybody <laughs> got out of the round and and we played it and and there was cheering when it uh when it fell and and crashed and everything but um no, it was uh, I, 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 I think I had said on here that I would consider it to be um, sorry, I think I made a noise there. I would consider it to be a success if um, if uh, the engines relit. Yeah. You know, like there was a small chance that like something might get thrown up into the engine. It doesn't actually get up off the ground or anything. And there was a small chance that something would go wrong in the air or whatever. Um, there's a small chance that the actuators doesn't, don't work and it falls uncontrollably and whatever. But like, uh, my whole thing was like, as long as they can relight the engines, cause they'd never done that before. Yeah. That's a success as far as I'm concerned. So when they, when they lit it and it swung, I was like, Oh my God, it's working like that. That blew my mind. And then I saw the green coming out of the engine. I was like, Oh, Nope, it's over. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Something's all right. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, no, it was, uh, it was, it was amazing. Yeah. It, it was they they did so much more than I thought they would. I, I was shocked at how yeah, how accurate their landing was. Like it landed exactly where it was supposed to land. It obviously It didn't... was it was off a little bit. It kind of hit the edge of the landing pad. Oh, but did still, it? I mean, considering it fell that whole way and landed And this where had it was never been to. done before. It was all yeah, yeah. like what is yeah. Yeah. That's awesome, man. Well, I'm glad, and so, I can't wait to see whatever you were recording. So, um, I st I still keep going back to like the idea that they're gonna fly people like that someday. <laughs> I just I don't see that happening for a while. I just don't like like what I was thinking was as many times as we've seen the Falcon 9 first stage land 
on drone ships perfectly. Um, would you want to be on one? <laughs> no. E even even with the record of success that it's had, would you feel comfortable being strapped to a Falcon 9 first stage and landing? Yeah, you know, maybe with uh, an abort system, yes. Okay. I, I mean, comfortable? No, I'd be crapping myself the whole time. But <laughs> just falling out of the sky. Yeah, yeah, but but just but the uh, well, and and the whole like maneuver thing. Yeah, I would be. No, I'm I'm not cut out for that. But I could see it being like okay, and then as it's coming down, if it starts to get screwy, you can shoot off and be totally mm -hmm. fine. I could see that happening, or being acceptable, but not having that. Like Starship doesn't have that. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I would want to yeah. be in something that is so strong that even if the whole thing blew up, I'm okay. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like, like whatever capsule yeah. is inside, pressurized, whatever, the whole thing can blow up around me and we're just still chilling. That would yeah. be, which I know probably won't be real either. So it'll just be- some major uh, airbags. Yeah. I mean, I'm thinking, I don't know. I mean, and by people on that, you're talking about astronauts, not like- Regular me and you, right? Well, I mean, if they're talking about the point to point uh, around the earth thing, like the, the people would be flying out like an airplane. I, That's the idea. Yeah, and and what's your what's your guess on when we'll see that? Like how many, how far out? That's that's what I keep coming back to. Like, how many times would you have to see that thing land over and over and over again before you would feel comfortable being on it? It would be a lot for me. Uh, a but lot. How, g give me a timeline here. I mean, assuming that it's up and flying by by next year and and landing successfully by next year, I mean, probably at least twenty thirty. Ten years, yeah. No, no. I mean, look, astronauts are different people. Astronauts right. are people who will take the risk and everything. Right. But somebody just right. like traveling from here to Shanghai or something, you know. Yep. That's that's different. Yep. No, I I I agree. I'm thinking I'm thinking ten years would probably be a a bit aggressive, even. You know, yeah. yeah. It, for me, it's it's on the timeline of full self driving being actually legal and like mm -hmm. out there. You know, yeah. is probably like for it to be like normal is probably twenty years. I would say. You know, I originally I was thinking like, will my either of my kids ever have to learn how to drive? Mm. I don't know because you know Jack is five, so he's still got what ten, eleven years. So it it might be normal by then. I doubt it still. You know, he'll still probably want to know how to drive a car. Yeah. Theo, he's only one right now, so he's you know, he's got fifteen years to go. It might be where he never has to drive and has no desire to even want to learn how to drive. Like cars fifteen years from now might be like, you know, just old dinosaurs like me, like, I don't trust it. You know, I, I'm the only one <laughs> yeah. out there. A bit. Meanwhile, people are like is that a steering wheel in that car? What the hell yeah. is that? Like, wow, I haven't seen one of the, you know. It makes me think of a, <laughs> a bit of a switch here. The, the, first, the first episode of Downton Abbey, the, mm. the Dowager Countess, the old lady, like she comes in and, and she's like doing this, like the electric light. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like why is there that's, light inside? Yeah. Ah. That, that's how it will be with, with the self-driving cars. Yeah. Speaking yeah. of, I could go right into a story. Go for it. Some guy that's a hacker, he hacks things. He hacked into the Ooh. autopilot augmented vision. Yeah. According to oh. Electrek. Uh, what's this guy's name? Actually, here's the Twitter feed that he... Green the only. Yeah, Green. Shout or out to Green. Green the only. I don't know. Um, but no, he's got some pictures here on his Twitter feed of, uh, of what he saw when he... Let me bump that up so you can kind of like see all the, the text on the screen and stuff. Let's see. What's, what's something interesting here? Walkthrough of tabs. Oh, I remember seeing this. These are all the settings. Are they settings or are they like uh, sort of like a, oh, what do you call that? When there's like a, a hierarchy, like a tab architecture or something? Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I thought what I'm these were all about. the, uh... yeah bookmarks and snapshots clear to go i don't really know exactly what i'm looking at and, and so for the people who are just listening you're really getting screwed here but there's uh there's a bunch of uh there's a lot of like, buttons on the screen yeah just kind of under the hood stuff 
Um, seems like there was one that was like, oh, here we go. Yeah, where you can see the actual car driving and it's detecting. So, so I took a ride with Mercedes in their self-driving S class. Geez, what was that? Three years ago now, and this is what theirs looked like essentially, where it uh, had, okay. but it was it wasn't something that was like built into the car. It was like a computer that they, the engineering team, had placed inside of it, and it was doing this. Um. Yeah, that's interesting. So you can see. Yeah, that's awesome. This is super cool. So if you guys are wondering what we're looking at, it's uh, a, basically like the camera dash cam in the car with all the drawing of lines and objects yeah. and things. I remember- so those, those pinks are on the edge of the road. So I guess that's the, the road edge. And then the greens are like the, the lane markers. Did, does he take this on a are. place? Because now that they have this in- uh, you know, like the full self-driving beta where apparently you can go into... How is he getting the screen recording, by the way? I'm very jealous of that. I can't <laughs> tell you how many times I'm trying to, like, get a, a good recording of the screen, but because, you know, cameras and light, yeah. it's very difficult. Look at that. Stopping for traffic control. Yeah. His car is named Elon, by the way. No, no, that's his profile. Oh, okay. Yeah. Wow, uh, this is cool. Yeah. So yeah, green green the only on Twitter has been doing this forever. Uh all these kind of things. Oh, okay. Yeah. So so I'm this is new though. Um and I haven't seen this one before. Well, we'll put links in the description and stuff so you can go and look at all yeah, this. Yeah, so so it, it just kind of begs the question about full self driving though. Like when do we really think we're gonna see it? I mean, when, when like is there an aggressive timeline that's you know, and and I think a lot of people, like, what's your experience been? Let's just start there with autopilot because you don't you don't really use it that much, right? Because you don't drive too far. Yeah, I, w I would put myself in probably the the lower quartile. <laughs> Is that the word? Um, yeah. Of 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 people who use it a lot, because um, I just don't drive that much. I I work from home and and. Um, Normal. I mean, normally I would I would get around and see family that um, live all around Texas, but I haven't done that much this year. But mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I mean, it, I I find it to be it it kind of takes away that that base level that base layer of uh, anxiety, just driving anxiety that you might have because your car just kind of like handles the the basic stuff for you. Yeah. Um, my my favorite thing is when you're in stop and go traffic, just turning yeah. on autopilot and just hanging out. And just yep. it just goes the especially considering I, I came from a, a manual transmission car where I was always like pushing the clutch and doing that whole thing. And yeah. if you're on a hill, just God help you. But um, but I mean, you know my experience with the uh, smart summon has not been great. <laughs> so yeah. uh, so my 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 level of uh, trust in it is pretty low. But um, but I mean. Yeah, it, it keeps me in the lanes and and it takes away a little bit of stress when you're driving. Have you tried the more advanced things, the navigated in autopilot or any of those mm -hmm. kind of things? Yeah, yeah. And you ha have you had it try a, a an off ramp on a freeway, like a freeway mm -hmm. to freeway change? At, yeah, how has that gone? Worked. I, I didn't have any problems with it, but it's it's man, it's 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 wild when suddenly the blinker just starts going. <laughs> yeah. When, when something that's always been a manual thing. Is just suddenly doing it on its own. It's just kind of like, right. oh, that's weird. Because just the um, lane keep feels just kind of like cruise control, but a bit more advanced. Yeah. So it to yeah. automatically be changing lanes is a bit of like, hey, what's it doing? Why is it doing that? Right. Yeah. Well, the um, so yeah, I guess it's part of navigating an autopilot is going around slower cars. Yeah. Um, which, uh, yeah, I disabled that in my. Oh really? Yeah. Well, because it it has. In my experience, it's not good at knowing that, hey, there's you're slowing down in your lane and I want to get over to go around these guys, but there's a guy coming up about 90 mm -hmm. miles an hour that mm -hmm. for whatever reason you're not seeing. I can see it in the mirror and holy crap, you're going to pull right in front of him. You know. Yeah. Um mm -hmm. and even if you it's it, even if you as the driver wanted to pull in front of him, you could do that, but you know you better stomp on it and get out of the way because you don't yeah. want them you know, so I've had a few close calls where it's it's attempted to do that, and I was like, "Oh God, no, no! Like, just slow down. I'm fine in the slower traffic." Like, yeah. so I completely disabled that that feature on mine. Well, the thing that always, and again, it might just be because I don't use it that much, and I haven't had the time to figure it out or whatever. But like, it'll it'll come up with a little thing saying, uh, 
we're going to go around this guy. Yep. And and you have to like jerk the wheel. Yeah. Or you I always like, get super confused and maybe I'm like nervous about it or something, but it's like I, I jerk the wheel and then nothing happens, then I jerk the wheel again and then it goes. <laughs> Um, but it's like, how many things do I have to do to get it to do this thing that's supposed to be automatic? I guess it's... you can also just move one of the scroll wheels. Yeah, because that yeah. that lets it know that your hand is on the wheel. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah, just I've, weird. So we just got back, uh, my family and I, from a, a quick road trip to Idlewild, California, where we had a nice cabin, kind of out in the woods, and a little you know reset and all that. And uh, we were driving our our Model Y, which is you know brand new. Um, it barely, I was looking, it barely has 5,000 miles on it now, which is kind of crazy. Uh, but that's just COVID, you know, not driving, mm-hmm. not going anywhere really. Um, and so we're driving up and we get the whole family in the car. And I mean, within the first 20 miles, I've had two phantom braking things mm-hmm. where it like literally slams on the brakes from going 70 miles an hour and the baby starts crying. The kid's juice goes flying, like <laughs> oh, Jenny's spilling drinks. I'm like... This sucks, man. It is totally unreliable. And huh. and what did it see? Like a shadow on the road or yeah, something. Like yeah. like literally there's it, there's nobody out. We're like, you know, it's not like we were in traffic and it saw a car or anything crazy. It just will slam on its brakes. And and then I'm like, okay, fine. So I, I go back into just driving totally manual. You know, 10 minutes go by, put it back in. Literally, like within five minutes. Just So huh. it's just it's just like, this sucks, dude. It's totally unreliable. And uh I tweeted out my, my opinion on it was every time I get in a car with autopilot two or above, I'm reminded how much better autopilot one is because autopilot before, one yeah. never has had this. It can't do the more fancier things like going around the cars or the off ramps or whatever, but it's the honey badger of autopilot. It does not give a crap <laughs> if someone's coming in your lane or whatever it's going. Uh-huh. And, uh, and man, it's like, I just got a new well, a used model S that has the newer version of autopilot. And I'm just like, shit. Did I make a mistake? I should have got one with Autopilot 1 because the newer one, to me, in my experience, is just huh. very unreliable, you know? Which is weird because I would expect that, say, if it's like I'm in Detroit and it's snowing, and you're like, well, yeah, yeah this is just hard anyways. But I'm talking about like Southern California, sunny day, no rain, no anything, mm-hmm. no traffic even, and it's just constantly problem after problem after problem. So I don't trust it especially not with the family in the car. I will go mm. on regular cruise control, which does have the speed up, slow down, but I don't go on autopilot. I definitely don't go on navigate and autopilot. It just it just really, you know, destroys my faith that this is coming anytime soon in reality. I think we're still, mm. I don't know, 15 years out before it to be, for a car to actually drive itself and the people in, in it not to be crapping their pants every, every five seconds because it does something weird. Yeah, I've I've had mine hit the brakes uh, going under an overpass. I yep. guess it saw the shadow and freaked out. Yeah, but I mean it's only happened once or twice. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then and then we tried it on the way back, and in certain conditions it worked fine. And then I I just it's almost like I can tell when I get on the freeway and there's no traffic or, uh, at all, it's not going to be good. So I don't use it then <laughs> when it should just be the easiest setting. But when yeah. it's yeah stop and go traffic or. Even like like smaller roads, it seems to do better than normal freeways, just because maybe it's just a straight road and there's nothing happening. Versus like, you know, merging and, and I don't know how the the freeways are out there. Other than that, that time we were in Austin and it was like ridiculous. But <laughs> but but like uh, here you have a lot of on ramp off ramps that are just constantly like you could just be going straight, but to stay on your freeway you have to get over five lanes at times. And yeah, so yeah. it just doesn't seem to do well in in those situations here, which is super ironic considering where Tesla's from and uh, how easy mm-hmm. this should be. You know, does it still do the thing where, um, say, you are approaching an on ramp and the and the road widens before it splits into two, mm-hmm. uh, or or the other way? If there's if there's like a, ra- a lane that comes in and and suddenly it, it tries to split the difference and go in the middle. Yeah. Does it still do that? Because like that used to scare yep. the crap out of me. I had to be in the right lane, just cruising along, and then all of a sudden they just whoonk well into the center yeah. of this extra wide lane. Th- that's exactly exactly what happens. And prior to the phantom braking thing I mentioned on our on our most recent trip, uh, we, we were in a lane, and, and so what you see out here, and I don't know that our freeways are crazy or different or whatever. I just I just know this, but we're we're in the carpool lane, and the carpool lane splits into two, because mm. what happens is now. 
there there's going to be the two freeways right and and you if you want to stay because we have out here anyways hov lane to hov lane from freeway to freeway so you never have to get out of the hov lane the carpool lane mm -hmm. and so what will happen is you're just in the carpool lane and it will then split into two carpool lanes that are going to go their separate ways and yeah as we're doing that like this one case in particular there's actually like a, a wedge of a, a concrete barrier and the car just went straight into the point it did not pick a lane it did not do anything and oh, i was like Lord. oh shit like like it was <laughs> i mean and, and that guy died in san francisco mm -hmm. with that exact same thing man and i'm just looking at it going whoo i mean i'm all about but, future technology yeah. but with my kids in the car I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll, I'll just, I'm happy just to drive. I'm happy just to be normal. You know, there's, there's just so much that our brains subconsciously process that, that we don't even understand how it does it. And, and trying to put that into software, it's just like, it, it, it just I think takes it's, time. It's just you know? a lot harder than we thought it was going to be. Yeah. And it's, it's all about the machine learning and the data, which is why Tesla is far ahead of everyone else out there. I did just uh, test out the Mustang Mach-E. I was super impressed yeah. with that car. I actually really liked their, you know, whatever they call it, the the wannabe autopilot thing. But it wasn't. I wouldn't consider it super reliable or better than Tesla's. But as far as what it, what they claim it does, I was like, oh, it actually does it pretty well. So I was impressed with it, but I wouldn't consider them ahead in any way. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, I I think all of these like like just one level up from cruise control are going to really save a lot of people's lives and make driving mm -hmm. better. So I'm really I'm really like an advocate and, and happy and about all the steps we're going, but I, I'm, I'm a very, uh, hesitant to support like, yeah, let's all go full self driving today. You know, it's like, dude, it's so far yeah. and it's so, it's not like an app crashing on your phone. This is like, it puts you into a wall at 80 miles an hour. You know, it's a bit, <laughs> the consequences are a bit different. So yeah. Are there any like racing leagues, self-driving racing leagues? <laughs> it seems like I'd heard about something like that. Yeah, there is. Uh, oh man! Like, I wonder how much that could actually help. Uh, there is, there now. is. Uh, it's all electric and it's autonomous. I forget what it's called. Like, like Robo Race, I think is actually might be called. And they actually, sponsored a bunch. Yeah, I think they sponsored one of your videos, <laughs> didn't they? Did they? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is one of those moments where, like, I'm I'm researching a new topic for a video, and it's like, oh, I've already done a video on this. Uh yeah, r Robo Didn't Race. Know. I'm I'm uh, I'm getting in my ear. And uh yeah, and, and there was a, I saw a funny tweet about it because it was like, the first one got shut down because one of the cars just like, <laughs> it took off from the line and just smashed right into a wall. It was just like, <laughs> just, <laughs> just, just grinding like, against the wall, sparks <laughs> flying. Yeah, and they were like, yep, okay, season over, <laughs> off to a good start. Yeah. Yeah, but you know, I, I look. But human drivers to the, do that too. So, right, I look forward to the day when when uh, when it full self driving is is really really here. Just every time I get in one of these newer cars with all the more fancy bells and whistles, I just get more discouraged. Unfortunately, mm. you know, it's because it's just not quite there. It's 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 like too advanced for its own good. You know, I still mm. look at that's why I think AP one is like. It's so reliable and solid. Yes, I love it. And then you get into the newer stuff, and I'm like, ooh, I got problems. There's issues here. And unfortunately, those issues could lead to bad things. So, mm. yeah. Mm. There you go. So there's a positive outlook for you. Yeah. For, for the day. You know me, <laughs> bringing the positivity. Well. Speaking of positivity, <laughs> why don't we talk about something that is happening <laughs> that is good. The Tesla Model Y rear-wheel drive deliveries are happening in January. Yeah, but they're all going to have that crappy autopilot in it. <laughs> uh, well, I guess, you know, this is for the autopilot stuff. This is where I absolutely would not buy full self-driving. I do not think it's worth the money at all. Um, uh, you know, the basic version of autopilot I think is great, and I think that saves lives and, and is good. But beyond that, I'm like, dude, $10,000 is a lot of money. I, I don't think it's worth it. Uh, it might be worth it someday, but I, I don't see that happening anytime soon. Um, but this is anyway. So we have the so right now, if you want a Model Y, Tesla Model Y, uh, you're looking at the all-wheel drive long range is the cheapest one you can get, which isn't very cheap. But now we're going to get the rear-wheel drive long range uh, version coming out soon, and so so this is going to be quite a bit cheaper. And apparently, someone. Um, Someone was chatting with Tesla uh, support, and they asked about it, 
and they said, I'm curious about the rear wheel drive Model Y when it's going on sale. And then they responded and said, we are scheduled to release the standard rear wheel drive Model Y in January 2021. Now, uh, the pricing information should be around $41,000 if my uh, price breakdown on my car, because that was the base price it listed for the car before adding in all wheel drive, before adding in long range and all those kind of things. Uh, and, and we're not quite sure exactly of the range or those kind of things, but it should be, it should be above 300 miles, I would say for the long range one. And, um, you know, it's coming soon. So I think it's going to be more people buying it. The, the, I don't know why they have a picture of a model X here or no, I guess that is a model Y. Look at that. It looks, it looks exactly <laughs> just like the, my, just the right angle. Yeah. I'm like, Oh, I thought that was, um, so yeah, so good news for people that want the Model Y but don't want to spend the sixty thousand dollars or whatever it is. What what is it right now actually? If you go to Tesla.com, look at Model Y. Order now. Uh, purchase price forty nine nine. Yeah, that's actually not bad because I, I believe the I believe it's going to be forty one thousand for the the standard one. So about ten grand less mm. or oh, eight grand less. So. 326 miles. You know, which I really question. Um, <laughs> uh, well, so ours, uh, we, I mean, again, our, our car has barely over 5,000 miles on it. We got it March, I think, of 2020, so this year. And fully charged right now, we get 304 miles. So that would mean we lost 20-something miles of range in 5,000 miles in less than a year. It doesn't seem right. Was that the stated range at the beginning? No, it was 316. Oh, uh, okay. But we did get a software update, and in Tesla, I could see where, where it bumped up the, the max range, but then this bumped up yet again. So I am a little bit curious as to... And, now, and they say it's an EPA estimated range, which means the EPA did a test to do that. It's not a, uh, you know, like a... a hopeful range or <laughs> I don't know what to call it but you see a lot of companies yeah, out there aspirational. like aspirational yeah this isn't this is like an actual number that was verified by the EPA apparently um so yeah so anyways that's coming soon and I think it's exciting because this is a a hot seller uh lots of people in into this car I think it's a great car I think it's going to it's fantastic uh if you're looking to get a Tesla and you have a family or you know you just need more stuff I think Tim even talked about it because of just his camera gear and stuff he needs, right? Mm -hmm. So, Model Y yeah. getting a bit cheaper. More cars. Buddy of mine um, that I meet with on Wednesday nights, he's sort of in a little mastermind group of mine. His name's Amen. Uh, he's up in Canada and uh, he's getting his today. All right. He was talking about it last night. He was all excited. Yeah. Yeah. The and I don't know when the Model Y is going to Europe. I think it still isn't even close. It's not even a twinkle in someone's eye, but. Uh, we did see that they're now making the Model Y in Shanghai at the new at the China factory. There's some sightings of Model Y production actually beginning there. I don't imagine that those are actual customer cars. I think it's still just maybe testing stuff. Mm. Uh, so maybe Model Y coming to Asia soon. Did I see that they're already producing some in Berlin? No. Or is that you China? Not nearly close to. I, I don't believe I haven't I haven't paid attention to the Giga Berlin stuff because um, then there's the the Texas one as well. They've got a lot going on. <laughs> Tesla does well, right actually, now. I've got this pulled up. I was going to show you. Um, yeah. I found this guy on uh, on YouTube. What's his name? Hang on, I'll get there in a second. Um, his name is Jeff Roberts. If you guys are curious, um, he goes out there and does a drone shot of the Terra Factory build every day. Mm -hmm. So this every one day. was from yesterday, or is that today? That's yesterday. Nice. Uh, oh, okay. So there's a little time lapse of how it's coming, but uh, yeah. And he just flies right over it. That's cool. Yeah. Texas, you're allowed to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Before he gets shot down. <laughs> yeah, right. Right. But uh, actually, like the one from just a month ago, it was just an empty field with uh, a few like little concrete areas laid out, but uh -huh. it's, they've already got some building going on. Nice, man. That's really impressive. I, I, that would be a cool analysis that I've not seen is just how fast factories actually get built. You know? Um, it's one of those things I've never really thought about. And then right. you start to see stuff like this. And it's like, wow, that's actually a whole thing. Now, I wonder too, because especially we're talking about a manufacturing facility, not just like apartment buildings or something. 
it, it always seems at least like by me, you know, a structure for a new condo complex will go up in like a week. You know, you just, yeah. you, you don't drive by there and then all of a sudden you drive by, you're like, holy crap, that's, and it's that's just there, there now. Yeah. But then it's like months before the plumbing and the electrical yeah. and the drywall and the lights and the, uh, you know, flooring and all the things happen. So I wonder how much, like how that compares, like getting the structure up, you know, is that super quick? And then it takes even longer because you're talking about heavy machinery you have to build in there, you know, but I know the China one went up. I mean, they they went from nothing to making cars in the same year, which is bananas. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm sure there's people listening to this that work in construction and understand it completely, but it's like, yeah. it's, it's all, it's, it's like magic to me. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's, what's really fascinating about it because it, there is a, a big sense of just like, what, how does that work? You know? But if you've been well, doing just, it forever, like, you're like, oh, this is normal. The, the, the planning that has to be around it and just the, the, the logistics and the, the, how they break it all down and all the pieces like, like on this, where's he going on here? <laughs> in, like, in some of these earlier shots, there's like, uh, you can see there's two different segments and I guess they've got to meet in the middle. Yeah. Yeah. There, see. So they're like building toward each other and they've got to be perfectly accurate or else it oh, won't right. line up. And, right. I mean, I know they've got this down. They've been doing it for hundreds of years, but to me, it's just like, wow. Well, I kind of have this. I kind of have this theory about Tesla that beyond their, uh, you know, software or because if you break down a lot of the technology in a, a Tesla car, th there actually isn't a ton of stuff that is that is truly an invention or something that's never been done before. They, like mm. the battery cells that they use are the same battery cells that have been used in all kinds of stuff for you know 30 years now. Uh, the electric motors that they, they, they created, but that type of electric motor is not new at all. You know, so a lot of the stuff it was like I think it was really innovative how they brought it all together, but there were very few things that were like truly had never been done before. So I'm actually wondering if Tesla's like advantage here. So to make a facility like that. I mean, I know friends that have uh, built custom homes, and holy crap, the 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 zoning and the permitting and the and the surveying uh, and the civil engineering and the architect and the design, all of that stuff takes like forever. And you're talking like a residential house. Yeah. That must be the most basic, like you know, two foot putt compared to <laughs> what building a factory is like. So I actually yeah. wonder if one of Tesla's key advantages is like like if they almost have either some way where it's software driven or some kind of machine learning algorithms where they're like, oh, almost like a Kerbal Space Program for building factories. Like, hey, we need to build these <laughs> things. Click, 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 boom, we've got a factory. And then it like, yeah. let me, let me, because even what you're seeing there, yeah, like all of those bits have to be perfectly designed before you start putting concrete in the ground, right? You can't just go there and be like, ah, oh, we'll figure it out when we get there. That doesn't work. <laughs> like this needs yeah. to be all designed within, you know, an inch or two. So I wonder if that's one of their key advantages is like almost like being able to replicate these factories all over the world. Just like, hey, just give me this big of a flat plot of dirt and bam, I, I've got the plans for you. I mean that was that was always kind of their thing was the machine that builds the machine. Yeah, you know, so probably shouldn't be too surprising. Because that that's where they'll be able to catch up. I I think I did a video on this uh, where I looked at all the factories and and if, and if the numbers for the output of all these factories is true, or you know comes close even with next with, that means that next year they could produce over a million cars, and then within three or five years they could be making five to seven million cars. Yeah. And at five to seven million, you're playing with the big boys now. You're, you know, we all think of Tesla's like, oh, the biggest automaker. But really, in terms of number of cars, they're very, very small. Yeah. But when you're doing five to seven million, you're up there. And then once you get above 10 million, you're like top tier. You're like making as many cars as Toyota almost. So yeah. it's a pretty, I mean, so if they, I wouldn't be surprised if next year we, they, we get a couple more factories announced, you know. Maybe another one in North America, maybe another one in Asia, something like that. Um, and yeah, these things just start, they just start banging them out. And once they do, man, then it's game over for, 
anyone that's not already on this electric train. Especially if the uh, cost per kilowatt hour goes down below 100. Hey. Which, I didn't know if you had that pulled up or not, but we were, we were talking about it earlier that they might, uh, it might cross that threshold. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Bloomberg New Energy Finance, I think it is, right? The NEF. Bloomberg AF. Annual battery price survey finds prices fell 13% from 2019. And so this is where battery pack prices, so key thing is battery pack prices, not just cells and energy, uh, cited below $100 per kilowatt hour for the first time in 2020. Um, the market average is above that, but this is the magic number that a lot of people, a lot of analysts, including these guys, have said. Once you get to $100 per kilowatt hour at the pack level, not the cell level, then your car should be about the same price to manufacture as a gas car, similar gas car. Mm -hmm. So this is where you could get the fifteen thousand uh, dollar, you know, Ford Fiesta electric or something like that, right? The like, the the, the tiny little dinky car that is is electric, but is you know the same price as like a, a regular gas car. So, so so that's the cost to produce it. That doesn't necessarily mean that they would be charging the same amount. Uh, or or um, selling it for the same amount uh, as a gas be careful car. Saying the word charging when you're talking about an electric car. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think that that's the idea, though. I think the idea is if you can get this, if you can manufacture an electric car for the same price as you can a gas car, then let's let's bring the cost down to the same price as the gas car, so that way more people buy it. Yeah, uh, yeah. you get more. So you can see just kind of this little chart, a little bar chart here. Um, I don't know what these different colors mean. This makes this isn't yeah, you know, my favorite chart. Oh, in the pack world. and sell. Um, I think what you're looking at is maybe, oh, okay, oh, okay, there you go. See, this is not a great, yeah, anyways. But what you're seeing is <laughs> it basically in 2013, we were looking at overall about $668 per kilowatt hour. Now we're at 137 for an average uh, with, you know, probably Tesla being the ones that are able to get it below that. And this is before the new battery cells from Tesla that they announced because mm. that's still a couple years out, it sounds like. So, good news. More more EVs yeah, on the road. It's kind of crazy when you look back over the last 10 years. I, I, I do a little bit of that in my next video, actually. Um, not to spoil that bit of our show, but um, it's... It's just kind of it's 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 nuts to look back and see how how much the 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 cost has gone down and how how far things have advanced. Yeah, it's actually it, it's almost shocking to look back at 2011 and be like, wow, there was nothing back then. Yeah, I mean, not really. Mm -hmm. the, the Nissan Leaf, basically. Yeah, which I feel bad for Nissan because they really aren't even in the conversation uh, today. Yeah, uh, they have the new Leaf. I'm sure 147 miles of range or something as of today. Maybe 150 or 160 in that ballpark. Mm -hmm. Woo! I don't know what to say to that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, not nearly enough, I would say. And then they have their new Aria. I think it's called coming out. Mm -hmm. uh, Aria Stark uh, yeah, partnership. It, it stabs uh, White Walkers. <laughs> there you go. That's one of the features. You know, yeah. if you find yourself in the Game of Thrones, bam! Got got my Nissan. I'm good. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so that that will be coming out, and that's an SUV. But again, the specs are not impressive at all. What you got? I, 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 I'm sitting here like, a car has no name. <laughs> uh, Game of Thrones. I miss Game of Thrones. Remember Game of Thrones? Remember what a <laughs> cultural juggernaut it was, and then just like nobody talked about it anymore after it was over? <laughs> yeah. Like, like, like White happened. Walkers, how about COVID? <laughs> like, that's the... <laughs> where's the Arya Stark of uh, to defeat that one? Anyways, uh, speaking of 2011, man, we should have all bought Bitcoin back then, shouldn't we? Was it around back then? I don't know. I think it was 2009 when it came out. Oh, okay. Uh, this was just a side note, not really, like, something we normally talk about, but Bitcoin just hit an all-time high of $23,000, looks like. And me and Joe were both kicking ourselves for not buying more back then. Yeah, almost well, I remember, so, so I'm looking at this chart and I'm remembering when it did kind of blow up right at the beginning of, of 2018. Yeah. And it was like this bubble and everybody's like, oh, this is ridiculous. And then, you know, it kind of went back down and, mm -hmm. and then just kind of like hung around. I don't really follow it that closely. So uh, yeah. there's a buddy of mine that's like all into it, just constantly yep. talking about it. But what do you think about this concept of a currency that is not... 
you know, run by a government. I, I get the lure of it. I definitely do. Yeah. Um, Have you looked into it at all? I'm, I'm sure you've done a video on this, right? I've done, yeah, a couple of videos, uh, not just on this, but blockchain, which is, you know, it's based right. on everything. Um, I don't know. It's one of these, first of all, I, it, the the only knowledge I have about it is what I found when I was researching it. It's not something I'm like into, like some people are just like obsessed with it, you yeah. know? And, yeah. uh, and, and so anything that I'm about to say, they're all going to be kicking their, their windshield and like Joe's an <laughs> idiot. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I really, uh, I just have to speak in vague terms because I'm, I'm not an sure. expert in it, but, um, I mean, I, I find it to be an interesting concept. I, I like the idea that we kind of, um, can redefine what currency and money is, um, in, in the, in the coming years. And, um, there's, there's a lot of talk around, like, we need to, we need to change what currency means, um, or find, find a way to create value around things that don't revolve around uh selling and buying things like in the whole capitalist mm -hmm. thing we got going on you know but mm. like some 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 other some third road i guess is, is a way yeah. of putting it um and I, I find that very interesting and, and i've always just kind of like been sitting on the sideline like let's see what happens i'm, I'm interested but let's see what happens and we'll see and, I, and i'm still kind of there um yeah. i mean it's, it's always seemed like a very speculative bubble kind of thing um mm. with with bitcoin and, and and it might still be i don't know but it's kind of like at some point it's like but what are the practical applications of this right and i think that's you where know? it fell down in 2018 or whatever when it when it really blew up and then i remember you could like go to the store and you know buy socks with bitcoin or something and the problem with that is the way the bitcoin uh, bitcoin <laughs> bitcoin <laughs> <laughs> the, the way the bitcoin network is designed it's not really made for high transaction processing throughput mm -hmm. so it's not made to be processing billions of transactions per second which is like what the world does maybe even trillions yeah. who knows uh so the thing about that is it's not what i think people thought it was going to be so mm -hmm. it, it's not a currency in the sense of like i can take a piece of paper and go give it to someone and they give me a thing and it doesn't matter what anyone else in the world is doing in that moment. It will not affect my ability to give that person my thing, my 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 uh, my, my dollar bill. But the uh, you know something like a reliance on a Bitcoin network, albeit decentralized one, and there's a lot of things there to talk about. But mm -hmm. that it, there definitely is a bottleneck and a problem. So I think that's what happened in 2018. It was like, oh, well, that isn't what we thought it was going to be. All right, never mind. Whoop gone um or that's my that's my guess as to why it fell yeah. and then that's where bitcoin cash came out as a new alternative that did have the throughput capability to you know work or whatever uh bitcoin is super interesting to me but you touched on it already blockchain to me is far more interesting because the problem we have in in digitizing things so uh, an interesting question is why don't we have electronic voting? Uh, I'm sorry, not electronic. Why don't we have like internet-based voting for an election? Well, because trust is the answer. And we've never been able to build a digital system that like couldn't be hacked. Um, yeah. where, where one party, uh, where, where you could build a system that has trust uh, like enabled in it that doesn't require a person saying yes that's right versus yes that's or, or no that that's not right so there is no arbiter in the bitcoin or in the blockchain world right there, there is a system that is a like trustless system and it can be hacked and there are ways most often when you hear about like Mt. Gox or Coinbase or something getting hacked, you're talking about an exchange or something like that, not Bitcoin, the blockchain network itself. Mm -hmm. uh, there are possible ways to do that. The 51% attack, if you own 51% of the coins on it, you can kind of do whatever you want. But point being, like that technology could enable us to truly move to digital without as much of a risk of of an attack of someone, you know, controlling it and, and forcing things. Cause even right now, when I go and I use my, my, my debit card and my credit card, it is, you know, asking 
someone, hey, is this allowed? Yes or no. And that someone can be wrong. You know, we've seen mm-hmm. Wells Fargo with like creating fake accounts for people. You've seen banks get hacked. I mean, it, it, it's a real thing. There is no truly like trustless system. You have someone that decides yes or no. And this is like the system decides. So blockchain would, in theory, if we can kind of, I don't know, I guess improve upon it, enable mm-hmm. uh, us to digitize almost anything that currently requires trust, like a ballot for a vote. Right. So if so, I really love the technology concept. the The actual currency thing is very interesting. I'm not sure if and when we'll get there, but uh, but yeah, m- maybe we will. Maybe we'll get to the point where we have a global currency that is powered by a decentralized network, which uses blockchain. So it's a trustless system, meaning, uh, you know. China, Venezuela, or France, or the U.S., or no one country can say yes or no to something. It is a truly decentralized yeah. thing, um, and yeah, there's no exchange rates because there's no exchange of currency. But I think that's a long way off still. So maybe yeah. Bitcoin or the con- you know, other coins out there, we're looking at it going twenty three thousand dollars. Woo, that's a lot. But really, that could be nothing. You know, a Bitcoin uh, 10 years from now could be worth several hundred thousand dollars. You know, we really yeah. don't know. Well, so you, you, I'm, it's you mentioned a worldwide, uh, the worldwide currency is one way of, of going. The other one that I think is interesting is like micro economies. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, like, let's just say I'm, you and I are creators. So there's like we have the Patreon thing and all these different, uh, you know, ways of, of making money or whatever. But um, there, there's also the option of like just create your own coin. Right. You know, and again, I don't understand this very well, but but the idea (laughs) being that like, uh, just, just take, like, take your whole revenue stream or your entire company, like off the grid. It's got, it's got its own little, its own little economy, its own little currency there. And, and you can trade and, and move things around in there. I don't, I don't exactly understand how this works, but that was one of the things that kind of struck me. It's kind of like, you can just create your own system if you want yeah with with these with these tools um and and then blockchain getting away from uh cryptocurrency um when i was doing the video on cobalt it was talking about how blockchains can be used to trace uh, supply chains to mm-hmm. prevent like conflict minerals from getting right. mixed in with with the rest and uh, stuff like that. So I think I think there's applications for blockchain outside of cryptocurrency right. that are and, really interesting as well. And the reason that would work is because the system itself would be one you can trust. Whereas yeah. if it were just like, oh, I have a person doing data entry and they just click a box, yes or no, this was conflict or not. Well, I'm just mm-hmm. going to give that guy a hundred bucks and he's going to say they're not. Right? So that's right. that's the problem is it's like an incorruptible system. Whereas every other form of currency or uh, exchange of value is controlled by humans and we are naturally corruptible and fallible it's not even a not even a dig against any individual person it's just that's the the nature of us sure you know (laughs) it's just especially when you start dealing with large amounts of money you have to just design around it you know yeah that's the full self-driving car thing you can't expect the person to take control in the last second it has to just be perfect and not have to rely yeah. on you because of that. So, uh, one last bit here. Uh, Swifty is asking about Ethereum. That that is another one that's also mm-hmm. I'm I'm far more interested in because it has this whole concept of smart contracts. So one of the one of the one of the like ways of a modern digital business uh, one model that that's really popular is the middleman. So you can think of Uber or Lyft or Airbnb as being the the, the middlemen or middle people, if we want to be more correct. Uh, <laughs> middle Earth. Mi- <laughs> the, the middle party between two parties that are transacting. And what do they do? They provide trust, right? How does mm. Airbnb work? Well, I want to go stay somewhere. Okay, cool. Uh, how, do, how does the person that's going to let me stay there know that I'm not going to destroy the place? And how do I know that when they show me pictures of these things that I'm going to go there and it's going to be like that, it's going to be real? Well, Mm -hmm. they have a system that is designed to create trust between those two parties. And that's what they get paid for, right? That's, and Mm -hmm. they just IPO'd and they have a ton of money, like, like whatever. So, so Ethereum's thing is using blockchain, but also like a smart layer, they call them smart contracts on top of it, that would basically allow you to create networks of things like Airbnb, 
that do not require a third party to be the arbiter of trust mm -hmm. between the two individuals transacting. So, yeah, I mean, all of this stuff I think is fascinating because it, it is, um, it's very digital, which I've been really uh, not against, but I've been like uh, disenchanted, unenchanted, I don't know, with, with digital stuff for a long time. That's why Tesla and SpaceX are so fascinating because it's like, real stuff physical yeah, stuff yeah, yeah. but this stuff to me is really incredible and in what it could mean for the future but i think we're still you know if we're thinking about like has that ship sailed like the ship is like not even prepped to leave the dock <laughs> as far as like what you know where i yeah. think the potential could be kind of like with starlink i look at starlink as like this could il erase the internet as you know it today and become its own worldwide internet that cuts the other internet out of our life. Like it could be that big of a game changing thing. Um, and so we're just barely getting started is how I look at all these things. It's really fascinating though. Well, when you were just talking about the whole trust thing with the Airbnb analogy, in, in my mind, I immediately go to like just information. Yeah, um, exactly. We are 100%. entering this place where nobody is on the same page. Yep. Uh, politically or whatever, you know, we're so polarized and we're all just kind of having our same, our, our own little uh, realities. And, um, and that's, that's one of like the biggest, that's one of the biggest things looking forward that I'm like, that's going to be a major problem. Yep. You know? And blockchain and, and, could and, do that. Blockchain well, that's could what solve I'm wondering. It. Cause like, um, I mean, there's some people that are making the argument and I'm not, uh, I'm, I don't disagree with this completely. Um, again, as somebody who once worked in newspapers, I have a little bit of a uh, soft spot for traditional media as flawed as it may be. But um, it was the idea that like there, there should be no gatekeepers. Information should have no gatekeepers. Right. right. Well, but, but then like any, anybody can put any information out there and it can become reality, whether it's reality or not. So it was, uh, I was reading a book and the guy was making the whole, um, uh, was it Churchill or whoever that said democracy is the worst form of government except for all the others? <laughs> I think it was Churchill that said that. Yeah. But um, but the idea being like having gatekeepers of information might be the worst way of doing it except for the other ways of doing it. <laughs> yeah, um, that's so, fair. But this, but this might be some kind of middle ground where it is like a, a, a digital blockchain uh, smart contract kind of thing of information of uh, of news yeah. that can kind of uh, keep 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 some semblance of uh, reality to you have together. To, you have to pull us humans out of the equation and blockchain is a way to do that, right? Mm -hmm. How to actually implement this and go about it, I don't think anyone has a solid answer on that yet, right. but <laughs> but clearly, uh, like there is actually uh, Ethereum-based, uh, there, there's an Ethereum-based version of Twitter where you actually have to pay in Ethereum to post. And I remember someone saying, some of some, so it was, you know, I'll say tweet, but I forget what the, the website was. But mm -hmm. he was like, it's great. It's like Twitter, except I have to spend $5 every time I, I post something. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, oh, yeah. Well, it would cut down on the the BS. Yeah, yeah. right. Right. If there, if there is a barrier to entry and it's not just complete whatever, uh, yeah. then you will inherently limit um, limit all of that. So was, was it Chris Rock that was saying the best way to cut down on shootings would be to charge fifty dollars for a bullet? <laughs> yeah, yeah. There you go. S simple. People would be a lot less trigger happy. Or you know, worldwide pandemic. Haven't been a lot of mass shootings. You know, since this whole thing happened. So that's a positive. There's an upside. <laughs> we have to really dig deep for these upsides yeah. in 2020. Are you ready to take a quick break? Yeah, let's do that and uh, let's hear let's let's do some some Q and A and some recap afterwards. How about that? Yeah, today's ludicrous sponsor is. Are you ready for it? Do you think you can handle it? Skillshare. Oh, my favorite. <laughs> Ooh, I pulled it up right at the logo. Uh, so we're all working from home these days. I think a lot of us have gotten kind of used to it, but there's always room to improve and get better and uh, increase your productivity from working from home. Uh, so one class that I can recommend is Thomas Frank's Productivity Masterclass on Skillshare. Mr. Frank. Uh, so Thomas is a productivity expert and a YouTuber like some of the other people that might be talking right now. Um, and uh, he, this is kind of like what he does on his channel. He talks about productivity and, and uh, uh, all of the little tics and tips and tricks and stuff. But for this, for this Skillshare, uh, class, he kind of combines all of his best tips for living your best life, meaning organizing your digital files, organizing your inbox, taking notes, task management, and uh, and he also has an epic beard, which is 
Just we're all jealous of. Almost as epic as 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 Ben's. Ooh. Almost. Appreciate that. This is just one of thousands of classes on Skillshare, covering everything from business essentials, graphic design, marketing, video production, cooking, basically anything that you're interested in. There's an expert ready to teach it to you on Skillshare. So join the millions of students already learning on Skillshare today with a special offer just for our listeners. Skillshare is offering our ludicrous future listeners unlimited access to thousands of classes for free for a limited time. To sign up, just go to Skillshare.com slash OLF pod. Again, go to Skillshare.com slash OLF pod for your free trial. Ben, you want to take the third one? Skillshare.com slash OLF pod. Skillshare, 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 Skillshare. Skillshare. <laughs> See, that, that, that beat my little uh, Skillshare riff. <laughs> you beat me. Today's OLF is also brought to you by Brilliant. We're just, we're just, we're just getting people smart all over the place. Smartest. You can learn Smartest. skills and brilliance. So, uh, you know, on the show, we talk about rockets a lot. We were talking about the, the SN8 earlier and how it goes up and then went down because of gravity and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you know, Tim's really smart on that kind of thing. I can get kind of in the weeds on that subject. But if you ever feel kind of lost on that subject and want to get more educated on it, but you don't have the time or the interest and in totally going back to school, you can check out uh, brilliant because they have a classic mecha classical mechanics course which i can't even say right <laughs> so i need to go i need to go refresh my mind on we need the one, pronunciation but... course first yeah uh maybe that's uh yeah maybe they have that um they describe that as a hardcore training for the aspiring physicist but don't let that scare you the thing that's really cool about brilliant is that if you haven't checked it out they kind of walk you through all the process of understanding these things one piece at a time uh, and they do it with fun quizzes and interactive puzzles and animations they basically hold your hand and let you to kind of figure it out on your own that's that's what i like about it it's like it, you kind of learn it in a way that makes sense for you um and it's not just memorizing facts and figures. It taps into your innate problem-solving skills. So uh, they basically, uh, you know, it, it helps you to get better over time at that problem-solving you can use in all different areas of your life, which is really cool. Uh, this classical mechanics course covers everything from Newton's laws to kinetic and potential energy, reference frames, and of course the rocket equation. So you know what Tim's talking about here. And it contains 49 interactive quizzes, and by the time you're done, uh, you might even could teach Tim a thing or two. Mm. What does Tim know? Has he even taken his class? He's not even here. He's not even here. Yeah. What he can't he even show up on time. Mm -hmm. Tim. <laughs> kind of person goes by Tim anyway. So there are dozens of other courses on Brilliant, spanning relativistic physics, quantum mechanics, even logic and all levels of math. So uh, if you like solving puzzles and keeping your brain fresh, there's also daily challenges that you can just kind of pull up and have fun in your spare time. And you can sign up for free and test it out for yourself if you go to brilliant.org slash OLF. And with the first 200 people that sign up, get 20% off a premium subscription that gives you access to all their courses. I've been talking about Brilliant on my channel for years, and uh, it's a lot of fun. So they're always getting better, always adding new stuff, always new uh, fun puzzles and whatnot. So anyway, I'm a fan. So it's brilliant.org slash OLF. Go check it out. I think you'll like it. Dun, dun, dun. Perfect. Dun, dun. And now back to our ludicrous programming. Hey, can I just share something cool? Always. Did you know there was a... Um, there was a uh, full lunar eclipse that just happened like uh, a few days ago. I didn't know that. Only a small uh, number of people got to see it because it was like just crossing the very tip of the southern hemisphere. So maybe some Chileans and Argentinians got to see it. Ooh. But uh, Argentina not, not us. But um, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's, their GOES East satellite, Captured footage of it, the shadow as it crossed the Earth. Take a look at this. Look at that. Whoa. How cool is that? Huh. So, yeah, there's the shadow right there. Now, so of course, it's the moon's shadow on Earth that's because really loud in my ear. the moon was passing through the in between the two, right? Between the Earth and the sun. Yeah. yeah. I mean, just the just the the day to night transition there is really cool when you look yeah. at it. Yeah. And there it just goes whoop, whoop. So yeah, it just kind of barely grazed the bottom of South America. Huh. I've never seen it from that angle before. That satellite's just perfectly locked, isn't it? Yeah. It's yeah, it's geosynchronous. Yeah. So I, I I'd, I'd never seen a shot like that before. I thought it was really cool. Hmm. 
This is from space.com, in case you couldn't tell. <laughs> Speaking of uh, things never seen before, particles, something, hit me with it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that other thing, right. Yeah, the um, thing you teased earlier. Yeah, so I was I was telling Ben before uh, we hopped on here that I'm I'm really I've got a bad habit of finding like quantum physics articles to share on the show and then having like five minutes to look at it before we record. So uh, quantum physics is famously very simple and can be picked up in five <laughs> minutes. So, um, but I found this today and and I don't fully understand it. But um, this made a few headlines, so I thought it was worth talking about. So uh, there's a third kingdom of particles. So there's fermions and bosons. Mm -hmm. um, I believe, hang on, it says down here. So I think that electrons are f fermions. Yes, electrons are fermions. And then the bosons, I believe, are like the quarks and the, right. which makes up the protons and the uh, neutrons and whatnot. Well, there's this other one that they've been predicting for years that would, would be a, a thing called anions. Mm -hmm. And um, apparently back in 1984, uh, a Nobel Prize winner, um, Frank Wilczek, a Nobel Prize winning physicist at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where the smart people are. Um, yeah, he predicted this back in 1984. Hmm this anion and um, apparently they'd done some experiments that started in 2016 and they've uh, they've proven it it's there hmm. yeah um let's see so it says uh show that these quasi particles oh, okay when electrons are restricted to motion and hang with me everyone when electrons are restricted to motion in two dimensions cooled to nearly absolute zero and subjected to strong magnetic fields very strange things begin to happen in the early 1980s physics used what these conditions use these conditions to observe the fractional quantum hall effect in which electrons come together to create so-called quasi particles that have a fraction of the charge of a single electron and it says if it seems strange to call the collective behavior electrons a particle think of the proton which itself is made up of three quarks um they do it if if you're if you're if you're watching this, you can see the the visual. And if you're not watching this, I'm just so sorry. Um, but they basically are talking about how like a normal particle can kind of loop in three dimensions around another particle. So it's not necessarily on a flat plane. It kind of it's not really on a loop because it can kind of move three dimensionally. But in two D, the loops can get caught up on themselves and kind of collide, like we were talking about a second ago, with the electrons, and it creates this this anion. Hmm. Now, what an anion can do, what we what we do with this information, what is the what, like what where why yeah. <laughs> that I don't know. It might just be a thing that we just discovered, and maybe someday there'll be some real use for it. Maybe they'll maybe that'll open up anti gravity. It won't. I'm just saying that like uh, uh, you, you never know where like the basic science stuff that we discover where it might lead. So th this is something that they've been predicting for a good thirty years. And uh, huh, and it's it's come true. It's always interesting to to see that we were able to think of this, and you know, I, I always go back in a lot of ways to just the Neil deGrasse Tyson, you know, fear of an of an alien species coming here that like we're just so dumb that <laughs> they won't even want to talk to us. You know, like if you um, were if you were walking around and you looked and you saw a bunch of ants, you're not going to think, oh, let me have a conversation with them. Right, you just get yeah, the raid out yeah. and game over for the ants. So it's a thing, you know. And so you see stuff like this. It's like, oh, maybe we're not as dumb as uh, as we think, you know. And then it's well, a matter. Uh, of what they do you might, do with this? Uh, you know, we do have ant farms, so there might be an there alien ant farm that's not just a band. It's called Earth, you know. We're in one. It's just a glass glass jar that they have us sitting in on their shelf. You know, here we are. Well, with yep. that, Joe, why don't we talk about some stuff <laughs> that uh, our Discord folks are sending us from 2020. And this is just kind of rapid fire here, hot takes on a few things. I've got a couple uh, things. If you're in Discord right now, just hit us up, drop us any questions you might have or topics. There was one here about this air plasma engine that can propel itself without any fossil fuels. Uh, potentially paving the way for carbon neutral air travel. Now, I know you did a, vi a couple videos recently on this type of a thing, but did you come across this at hair. all? Have you looked at this concept at all? I wish I had dove, dove in, dived. I wish I had dived deeper on that. Um, but uh, what 
okay, what's flashing into my head was that it was a Chinese company that was working on something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, I I don't have much of a hot take because I I haven't really yeah gotten into it. But well, but I mean like so so um a, a normal jet engine you it has to burn you know oxygen in it or it uses oxygen to burn the fuel. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think the idea of an air plasma engine is that it just like heats up the, yeah, it heats up and ionizes the air until it just, uh, combusts. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. So the interesting thing about it that we've talked about before, or for me, and apparently they, they, you know, this is just an idea at this point, but, um, the interesting thing for me is that after watching your video about an electric plane, uh, just how insanely hard it is mm-hmm. and how little a difference it would make. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, those are, so I, 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 I'm sure maybe someone's done this, but if not, I want to do it. Uh, it, it. So in business, you know, and I worked in tech or in corporate world for almost, or actually over 20 years, I guess, uh, w- we would come up with uh, a risk and reward a uh, little scatter plot diagram and we would have quadrants on there and we would put all the projects and things that we want to do and we would put them as to the reward how big of a deal is this versus how hard is it and something like electrifying or decarbonizing air travel would be one of those that is really really hard mm-hmm. and the reward is very very small So the bucket we would put that into, or, you know, from my analogy from business there would be the why do it category. Mm -hmm. Like it's not, the reward isn't big enough for how hard it is. So I guess that's my hot take on this. Sure. If it were easy and we could flip, you know, snap our fingers and make this happen. Great. But in the end, uh, you know, it's something where you're, it's almost like let's put all of our energy elsewhere on the, on the, what we would call the low hanging fruit, the things that have a high reward, but require mm. little or their few, you know, smaller effort. Um, like, you know, electrifying uh, automobiles, which is like, mm. clearly we know how to do is like not nearly as hard as trying to invent something new that would get, allow us electric air flight. So yeah, there's my I hot think, take I think there's it. incremental improvements that can be made in efficiency and structural improvements and how we, you know, have our air transport done that can bring down, the amount of uh, of emissions that are being caused, but I almost wonder if uh, if it would be cheaper and easier to just um, take that carbon back out of the air and with some kind of direct air capture or soil sequestration or something like that. Like it seems like um, it seems like that's something we could do a lot easier than than figuring out electric airplanes. But 100%. I have not looked at this this electric plasma engine. It sounds interesting. Um, I imagine it would re- require insane amounts of energy, though. Um, and of course, the more energy you need, the he- the more batteries. The more batteries, the heavier. The f- you know, it's 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 it's, yep. it's 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 worse than the rocket equation yep. <laughs> in terms of like the tyranny of it. Yep. 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 Agreed. So, uh, what is your number one story from twenty twenty? What's your top takeaway? Positive, tech, whatever. You're asking me? As, yes. as opposed to the other guy that's on this podcast? <laughs> uh, yeah. And we do have one coming from Tim, so we can cut to that after. But yeah, yeah, yeah. you first. Well, I mean, if I, look, just the story, the story has to be the pandemic in general uh-huh. and how that's affected everything. Um, but it, it, if you're looking for like good stuff that's happened, um, you know, uh, not only once but twice launching humans from from american soil for the first time in 11 years uh wait well, no 9 years 9 years 2011 yeah, 2011, is 2011. Time, so that's yeah, how i got right. yeah, i got tripped up there um but still i mean almost a decade went by when we weren't able to put uh, people into space that's insane and it's and, cheaper uh, right and it's cheaper um so that's huge in fact, I um, I saw something. I almost brought it up for the for the show, but somebody had uh, posted an article about how the Orion capsule uh, is still kind of in development for mm-hmm. fifteen years now, and has only gone into space one time. Yeah. So, the fact that in that same amount of time, SpaceX went from not even be able to get off the ground to 
uh, reliably launching humans into space is that definitely felt impressive. like a big moment where even during you know i mean we're post election now but during that time it felt a a a point where we could all kind of set aside politics and conspiracy mm. theories that really bombard us <laughs> online and just be in awe for a little bit. And so I agree. Yeah, that, that, that's a good one. I think um, the way the whole launch America thing was like all hyper patriotized or patriotic guys or whatever. Like I, I, I kind of roll my eyes a little bit at that mm -hmm. um, because it was kind of like, look, if we were so great, we wouldn't have been down for nine years. But anyway. <laughs> um, but I mean, it is a big deal. It's it's an absolutely big deal, and um, um, science wise, that's got to be one of the top things from from this yeah. last year. I think for me, probably, I, I don't know. It's like not the most biggest tangible thing, but but one of the most positive signs in terms of the, what's top of mind for me, which is like you know climate change stuff, is uh, the UK and California both uh, deciding to ban. Uh, sales of fossil fuel vehicles uh, within like a decade or so. I think 2035 mm -hmm. for California, 2030 for the UK, which the UK is is bigger than California. If people are curious, it's, it's quite a bit bigger, a lot more people there, but um, probably more cars here though. But anyways, point being like, we're starting to see really like the hammer come down on fossil fuel vehicles, which I think is great. <clears throat> and, and it's not without some support. Like I'm, you know, I, I always kind of have a sort of a sympathetic bone for these companies that have made these massive mega billion dollar investments in the fossil fuel technology that are just kind of getting getting hosed here by this whole thing. Uh, but, you know, so it's good to see, like, at least in California, I know um, there's like a big program for, for uh, companies that are switching to electric trucks to do so with massive tax incentives. You know, they mm -hmm. say, hey, look, yeah, we're going to give you 10 years to where it's just not allowed anymore. You cannot do it. But in between now and then, we want to try to help you get there. So we're going to offer you a bunch of tax breaks and those kind of things, which, which I think is the right way to do it. I really hate when you just have heavy handed government coming in and saying you can't do that anymore. Uh, you know, I like when there's more of a gradual incentive based approach to these changes versus the heavy handed draconian. Because because we've seen uh, in all over the world and here as well, where like a new leader comes into power and just. Yeah. somewhat arbitrarily erases all the stuff the previous guy did. So even if California says, hey, you can't do this, there's nothing to say that within five years, a new leader couldn't come in and say, actually, you can go do all that and you can do it more. So I like the idea of like incentive-based approaches that are economically driven uh, because that's, I mean, when we're talking in at least our system of, of economics in this country, that's really what makes decisions and gets people to move is money. Mm -hmm. It's not really like telling you, cause you know, you look at it like, oh, okay, well what's the fine for not doing it? Okay, let me just factor that into my cost. You know? <laughs> it's, yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So I, I, I like that. If the that. fine is not enough, then it's just, a, it's just part of doing business. Right, like Bill Gates getting speeding tickets. That's not gonna stop him. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's no yeah. no amount of tickets that you can give him that will stop him from driving, you know, 95 miles an hour down the fr yeah. down the road. He just loves doing it and money doesn't matter. So, yeah. So I think for me seeing that is 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 a big deal. Um and you know, and and I guess along along with that the Model Y really being delivered is is a big deal too because it's the most popular segment here in the United States. And, and you know the, one of the biggest car economies in the world, and then with with them making them in China now, like you just see electric vehicles from one from all angles becoming more and more popular. You know, Mustang, the Mustang Mach E is fantastic. VW is coming out with they already have the ID3 on the roads in Europe. The ID4 mm -hmm. is coming here. Like like mainstream automakers are really getting on board. I'm just it's just like a really exciting time. I think uh, despite yeah. the pandemic delaying the Rivian launch and throwing those kind of things like it's like very much like you know uh just up and up right now in this whole space mm -hmm. so real exciting stuff yeah i mean um and again i'm leaping forward a little bit to what we talk about normally at the end of these these videos but i mean my my video for monday uh is going to be about uh, all the all the new cars that are coming out all the new evs that are coming out in 2021 20, uh, yeah and it's 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 like it, the number is going to literally double mm -hmm. next year 
mm-hmm. with with all the the major manufacturers getting behind it finally and and, and for the first time it's not a compliance car it's not some right. loophole car they're like really putting an effort into it and 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 they're all scrambling to to again looking back 10 years it went from they were doing everything they could possibly do to not make electric cars to now like literally turning their entire business models upside down so that they can produce these new platforms so they can make all these different models on those platforms and stuff. Um, The amount of change that we're seeing right now is just insane. And, and if you, from my perspective, the reason that is has nothing really to do with government regulation. It has to do with Tesla just absolutely eating their lunch. Just, just, abs- <laughs> just when you see sales drop by forty percent, and you're a BMW, and have been around forever, yeah. and things don't happen like that, you're going, oh crap! I need to get going here. So, mm-hmm. you know, I, I, th- that's where I think Tesla deserves so much credit for what they've been able to do, not just for the actual cars that they have on the road, and despite the little whiny babies like myself that complain about all the little things. <laughs> <laughs> but by their success is forcing everyone else to get on board, and that's what I'm really thrilled about. And that's why I, I love when you see that these other automakers really, really doing a a full effort and not 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 the the half-hearted attempts like they did before, but the real right. honest to God, hey, we're gonna like that's why the Ford one really blew me away. It was, it's it's easily the most impressive EV I've been in that's not a Tesla. Um, in terms of a complete package, I would say mm-hmm. the, the Taycan was was mind blowingly awesome to drive, <laughs> but for a quarter million dollars and yeah. with a really odd, bizarre tech package inside, I'm like, no, I'm good. I would rather just get a Model S and have a hundred grand in cash. You know, <laughs> I would I would rather do that. But the Mach E, I'm looking at it going, dude, this is a very legit. If you like Ford, and there are a lot of people out there that really love them, I mean, you can look at it and go, I, I could see a lot of people going this way over, you know, a, a Tesla Model Y or any other EV, like the VW one. VW, same thing. Mm. It, it's most likely people that love VW that are going to like that car. I would say m- most people, I would say it's not it's not super impressive. But if you like VW, and there's a lot of people that do, a lot of reasons, people like what they like, whatever, awesome, go for it. There is a really good option there. So it's just... Yeah, it's really exciting. So, and there did not used to be, exactly. Yeah, before it was a joke it for was a very like, long time. Yep, yep. Well, let's cut to Tim. See what Tim's yeah big uh, big moment was in 2020. I think I think we all know what it is, but you know, <laughs> it's his new logo. That's what it just spoiler yeah, alert. That's what it is. <laughs> My highlight story of 2020. It's. It's insane to me that I actually had to think about whether or not DM2, the first time humans have returned to space from the United States on a brand new vehicle. It's crazy that I actually had to debate whether or not that was my top thing. That's how exciting 2020 was, in my opinion, um, in space flight. Uh, but that has to be the number one. I mean, that is still just a, a really exciting mission. I think that's one of those things that, um, you know, when we saw Bob and Doug finally fly on a Falcon 9 and on a Dragon capsule, it just doesn't get more exciting than that. And and it's just great news. It was, you know, such a flawless mission. And uh, and it just really, I, it was something g- good to look forward to. That was right peak, like kind of the, the, it was May 30th, right when the whole pandemic thing was really in, in just this mode of people are, hadn't found a new norm yet. P, you know, everyone's just, re- it was really, I think when a lot of people were struggling a lot with, uh, with how do you live, uh, in 2020 with a pandemic. And that was just such a sh- bright shining star of something to look forward to something to aspire to, you know, something to be excited about. So I definitely think that set a good tone for the future. Um, I definitely think that set a, uh, just something, it was just actually something to look forward to, which, uh, yeah, I mean, how can you not love that? Right. Um, and, and it obviously set the stage then for Crew-1, which already flew by the end of the year. So that was awesome that we actually got two crewed missions from the United States after basically, a, you know, a nine-year hiatus. Um, so, yeah, how I, I just I, I think that was fantastic. I think that was um, really cool to see the Dragon Castle perform so flawlessly, um, see the Falcon 9 perform so flawlessly. The, the, the vehicle, you know, the Falcon 9 is just so we, – we take it for granted now. It's already become one of the most – solid workhorse rockets and to see it finally be able to lift humans up into space same with the atlas five like when the atlas finally finally takes people up into space for me it'll be like it's about time because that has been just an absolute workhorse vehicle so yeah um so i I think dm2 has to be my story of the year um 
And it's crazy to me that it, it, that there's even can, any kind of contest, but there were a lot of really exciting things in space flight in 2020. And I think 2021 is going to be just as cool, if not cooler. It's just getting better from here on out, folks. So yeah, DM2, that's my pick. Well, um, so so Get Swifty was talking about like things that were uh, big for him, and he did mention the vaccine. And uh, I I had some we we this kind of came up before we started recording, so I thought I could just we could just kind of like talk sure. about it for just a second. Um, so there's the whole thing now, like the vaccines are co- finally coming out, and that's that's wonderful. Um, I've I've we're going to be seeing some debates about this for a while. And I'm, I'm, this is like the internal debate in my own head about like, is it safe? Do you feel comfortable taking this thing? Cause it was kind of rushed, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. There's, there's healthcare professionals that I'm friends with that um, have expressed their own concerns about it for that reason, because most vaccines take, you know, good three, five years to, to come around. And this one was done in like nine months. Um, and I've been, I've been thinking about it and uh, I, I I would rather get it than not have it still. Um, but one of the things that I was thinking about was like, maybe though it's, maybe it wasn't really that rushed. Maybe because, because I know that like the time frame that it took to get vaccines made just because of the progress of technology and everything has gotten so much shorter. I think the last one that they did was maybe for one of the swine flus or something. And it went from, you know, taking 10 years to three years or something. And that was in yeah. 2017 or whatever. Yeah. Um, so one would expect that the time frames are getting shorter and shorter just because of the advance of technology, but also just think about the billions of dollars that were thrown at this thing and all the people that the whole you know, world came like both went into the fields and came back into the fields from retirement and everything. And, and like the, uh, the, the global effort that went behind producing this, this vaccine, when you consider all that, maybe it's not too rushed. Maybe it's, maybe it wasn't too much of a, yeah. uh, you know, before it was ready kind of thing. Maybe it's, maybe it happened when it was supposed to. Yeah, no, it's, I think that was one of the more interesting bits was the approaches, the approach, well, I guess approaches that the different companies have taken here to getting it done quicker. And if that will, like the absolute, like rush focus, all in efforts by all these people, will actually enable us to be even faster in the future. So the next yeah, time we yeah. have something like this, we'll be able to get it out in six months or something like that. Like almost like we have an architecture to to follow. Uh, and so it's not yeah. a from the ground up approach every single time because you know coronavirus is a generic term that describes a bazillion things and mm-hmm. we're bound to have this happen again. I don't know if it'll be at this scale, but maybe what we've done is because now <laughs> I mean, the last time we had a major uh, pandemic like this, the technology wasn't nearly what it is today, uh, which I still am very disillusioned with technology. I still think like this all sucks. Like we're still living in the stone age, basically, <laughs> um, as, as amazing as it seems. So so I wonder if that's maybe one of the, the key outcomes. You know, if we look back in, you know, 10, 50 years, it'll be like, wow, that was like the uh, the spark of all of the vaccinations of all the different things and because yeah. of what we learned and what we were able to do. So. Oh, well, I mean, kind of to that point, Andy Andy Law in Discord over here was saying that the uh, the vaccine that was produced in uh, uh, 2014 was for the Ob- Ebola outbreak, mm-hmm. and that that created a model for this one to be done even yeah, faster. Yeah, there so. you go. Yeah, so so that's fantastic. So we just keep learning, you know. So we just need more of these to. Uh... <laughs> yeah, bring it on. Right, right. So we'll we get better we got better. through this one no problem. Yeah, uh, no negative ramifications. Even the strip clubs are working. Where's yeah, that's right. where's my whiskey? Oh, <laughs> yeah, that's funny. You know, and uh, I saw a thing about something about, yeah, people not wanting to take it. And I responded to someone on Twitter saying we need Elvis, um, which I, I don't think people got. But apparently Elvis uh, was on it was televised him taking the polio vaccine oh, to encourage okay. people to take the polio vaccine. So yeah. th- this is one of those things where, you know, we, we I, I've said it, and, you know, we probably all said it at times, like, this is the most divisive time in our history. And then it's like, eh, I don't know. And then it's like, we're so dumb now, we don't even trust vaccines. It's like, well, look at, you know, people weren't taking it. And so it's really cool. Like like uh, <laughs> someone shared, like, yeah, there's a video of Elvis taking the polio vaccine because mm-hmm. to try to encourage people to take it because people didn't want to take it. Yeah. People were afraid of it. And, and polio was, I mean, yes, this is all bad, not to discredit 
how bad COVID is, but there's something about seeing kids like babies with the polio. I mean, dude, that, that heart, like way, way yeah. more heartstrings being tugged at when you see that, I feel than the iron lungs. Yeah. It's just nuts. Uh. So, so imagine like the draw to be like polio vaccine, let's go everybody. Yes. And you still had to have Elvis on TV taking it, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. into, so we'll see that again for sure. Um, I know. Um, and it wasn't that long ago. Right. My my wife's mother had polio when she was a kid. Yeah. Yeah. That's not that long ago. And and, and she, uh, I mean, she still has some effects from it, but it's mostly like uh, the, the treatments that were done back then, you know, she's, they, they affected her in different ways. I don't need to go into why, but. Yeah, no, um, no. Yeah. So hopefully that's, yeah. And so it's already happening and people are already getting it right. Uh, well, pretty mm-hmm. much. Well, I mean, I don't know more U.S. and U.K. that that I'm aware of, but you know, wh- when do you think things are going to go back to to you know, quote unquote, normal? I think later part of next year at the earliest. Mm-hmm. Honestly, um, it's kind of funny. Like I'm I'm not patting myself on the back too much here, but I I, I did a, a a Joe Stradamus segment in in the video <laughs> that I that I did on COVID the, the last one, kind of like trying to predict how things would go down. And I was like, yeah, I think we'll probably have some vaccines approved by the end of the year, but we won't start getting them till the next year. I'm like, dude, I was totally right about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But um, but no, I mean, uh, so my wife's a teacher, and um, so she's probably going to be in one of the earlier groups of people that would get it at least i hope so mm-hmm. um but um, i mean she was saying that probably like i don't know march ish mid-spring yeah uh, they, were, they were saying like maybe june of next year before just anybody who wants it can get it yeah um so i mean it, it, and then they actually have to roll it all out so it's probably going to be and, and there's two treatments right i think you have to get it once and then come back in uh, three weeks or something and get it again okay so right now they've they've approved pfizer's and they've approved moderna's okay and i think only Moderna's is a two-step one. Oh, but okay. I could be wrong about right. that. Okay. Okay. Let me know on Discord, guys. <laughs> Correct me. 21, 21 days, days between doses for, for Pfizer. Pfizer. Okay. There you go. Yeah. Wow, that's a, that's three weeks. Wow, that's a long time. You see, I had it right. 21 or three weeks, yeah. Yeah, so it's, I mean, I'm, man. You know, now, what do you think is going to stick around uh through the like after this you know what what things that we change now are going to continue you think joe stradamus here (laughs) (laughs) um see that's the big question like how much how much of this is the new normal you know right um the way movies have had to be redone or or the 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 structure of the movie distribution okay um okay i think is like going online and first yeah because they were already going that direction and this was just like the, the final nail in the coffin not yeah. not to say that movie theaters are going to go away but i still feel like they're going to they're going to kind of evolve into another beast from just well, the place where you go to see the movies when they first come do out do you have the kind of luxury movie theaters out there mm-hmm. the more bougie ones um yeah, yeah so we have those here so for years i've like the typical movie theater experience for me as i got you know became you know, more, uh, I had more resources and whatever. I was like, this is terrible. I hate this. I'm never going like crowded, Mm. you know, people on their phones, coughing, sneezing, all the, I just, no, thank you. Like I'll just wait. Uh, but then we got these bougie ones, these nice ones. And I don't Uh mean bougie as a, uh, as a, uh, a negative term here. I mean, just, you know, the more lujoso, we would say the more luxurious (laughs) ones. And uh, and it's and I think they're fantastic. I love going, mm-hmm. you know. But yeah, I'm gonna. Are you talking like Animal, uh, Alamo Draft House? I don't know what that Are those is. Out there? Oh, no. Okay, maybe that's just like regional. So so we have two here. One's called the Lot, the Lot, and the other one's Sinopolis. Uh, and hmm. these are both. Like the lot is the one where you go and you actually order food. You have a server come to you. So you have these mm-hmm. these recliner style, like mega lazy yeah. boys that fully recline. You have like a little button you push and a little lamp and they'll come. You can have drinks served or like I usually go and they have excellent food. It's like a great restaurant. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's way too much money though. Like we'll spend $70 on lunch for two people. You yeah. know what I mean? Um, and then it's kind of weird. You're like eating your sandwich, like as you know, the movies happen. It's it's not it's not like the most typical thing, but I enjoyed so it. So you don't like it? 
Well, no, I I enjoy going because okay. I get to go watch a movie in a obviously a, a excellent like movie viewing setting. Sure. But I'm not bombarded with you know kids sneezing on me and crap like that. You know, it's like. <laughs> It's a much nicer experience. So so I'm in. But yeah, I think the typical movie theater experience is probably going to go away almost entirely, right? I I saw somebody making a prediction that it's going to be almost like um, going to a theme park or something where you, you walk in and out through the gift shop. Uh-huh. And that's where they make most of their money is is like selling you like like Disney would have their own theaters and they would have like a Disney store at the at the front of it that you would go through. And I could see that. Um, now, once upon a time, somebody who studied radio, TV, film in college, they they had something. Uh, I don't know the name of the law, but like the um, you couldn't produce and distribute the films. Oh, like the the, distrib- the distribution had to go through a third party, like a like the franchise dealerships here in Texas with the right. cars and stuff. Right. But, um, as to to prevent monopolies from happening, um, but that's yeah, that's changing. <laughs> I think that uh, get Swifty say yeah, they 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 un- undid that law this year, right? Um, and now that like Disney has their own streaming platforms and all these others have their own streaming platforms, um, something else that s- somebody pointed out. Uh, sorry, I'm kind of going down a movie tangent sure. here, but um, it got for a while there to where like if your movie didn't make a billion dollars, it was a failure. Yeah, you know. And so that that strictly limits the kinds of films that get made. That's why you see all these comic book films and, and films on pre-existing IP and whatnot, um, which everybody complains about, but then we still shell out our money for them. Um, but uh, it was talking about how like maybe, you know, when, when, when uh, most people are watching their films from home, once that paradigm shifts, um, they're not going to be making as much money on the back end. So they're not going to be like the, the production of the films might get down to sort of the more smaller mid mid range budget things, which we just haven't even seen in like 10 yeah. years, barely. Yeah. You know, uh, which is good for me. I, I like the idea of that because that's the kind of films I like to do, but also uh, yeah, it just, I mean, it's, it, it would be nice to have something that was original every once in a while. Well, you know, and TV is kind of like that too, right? You know, if you think about the budgets for something like game of Thrones, yeah. Uh, I, I remember watching a behind the scenes one of some, I think it's their, their most recent season. There was like some, like two or three episodes occurred in the same uh, setting. And to make that stage and everything, it was like $3 million just to make the set. And and you're <laughs> like, yeah, how is Parks and Rec supposed to do that, right? Like you can't have like right. like this. So every episode of Game of Thrones was basically like a full movie production. Um, so mm-hmm. t- and, and and if you look at TV ratings, they're all down tremendously as more people watch us like YouTube and whatever else. So the only thing that stands out are these mega production TV shows. Um, mm. And obviously that just limits it even more, you know. Yeah. So they'll they'll find a new way forward, a new balance there. But I feel like that's something that's going to change uh, because of COVID, the working from home thing. I mean, um, I, I mean, everybody's different. Some people would rather be in an office and away from the screaming kids and whatnot. But yeah. uh, but uh, I mean, it's I, th- I think it might be one of these things that once it's kind of settled, it's like just the the the, the paradigm again of of going into a job and sitting there at your desk all day long. It's like, it's, it's probably going to change. Yeah. I, I, that, that's kind of along the lines of one of the things that I'm thinking about that, that will change a lot is there are a lot of companies that were very against people working remote, old school mm-hmm. finance industries, et cetera, et cetera. Lots of companies that just, just, just despite the technology being super easy and whatever, uh, they just were against it. Uh, and, and I see the value in both in-person and and distance, you know, telecommuting. But part of it is like, I think now there's a lot of, well, why am I living in downtown? Why am I spending all this mm-hmm. money to be in this place that I, that I get zero benefit from? Why don't I move a little bit further out? Why don't I get a bigger house? Why don't I make my, my own gym? Why don't I have a room that's dedicated to my workspace? Uh, yeah. so, so I think we, you know, our, I know in San Diego, I've looked at it obviously cause I'm, I'm in that situation, but I wouldn't be surprised if we see a lot of trends of people kind of moving away from cities, uh, or, or you know, not mm-hmm. necessarily away, but instead of living right in the heart of it where, you know, you're in the cool area, you can walk everywhere. Maybe I'm a little bit further out. And if I want to go to the city, I got to drive 15, 20 minutes. I don't know. Mm-hmm. I could see that being a trend that, that probably continues beyond, you know, this immediate thing. 
Yeah, and um, we talked about this before, and in, in our, our our buddy Ben Price, van life. Yeah, you know, retrofitting vans and going out on the road. There's a friend of mine that did the exact same thing. I mean, once once you can work anywhere, you know, the the the, the wheels are off. You can go. You can go work at it by 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 a creek in Yosemite or something. Yeah, well, you know? was, and and then when Starlink, you know, when yeah. that comes down. But I was just up in Idlewild in California. Gorgeous, beautiful, small town. Mm. You know, mountains. Um, and I'm looking at it, going, why? Why do I need? It's quiet here. It's nice. Like, <laughs> you know, other than I can't get same day delivery from Amazon, and I can't Postmates anything I can, you know, my heart desires. It's great. Other other than like some very little things like that, you know. So. I don't know. I think that might be yeah. a big one. What about masks? Do you think we're going to con- continue to wear masks? I could see it going well into 2022. I mean, yeah. d- well, let me just, do people in Texas wear masks? I feel like that's probably a well, place where, where yeah. a lot of people don't want to yeah. wear masks. I mean, Dallas is not necessarily Texas. It's <laughs> <laughs> Right. Especially the part of town I live in. Uh, uh, but yeah, I mean... Here, here you see people in masks everywhere, and mm-hmm. it's kind of required. But mm-hmm. I, I also went to a funeral, uh, in a small town a few weeks ago, and stopped at a place to get coffee, and you wouldn't have known there was anything going on in the world at all. Really? It was just everybody was just walking around like nothing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I do kind of wonder about the pandemic fatigue, and how that's affected. Um, people's willingness to cooperate with things you know we had here a stay-at-home mandate um in in the state of california you know which is pretty that's pretty intense because you're talking about 40 million people i mean Mm -hmm. this is the most populous state in the country this is like a big that's a huge deal stay at home like do not leave except for essential things um I, I've, I've, you know, we've, we, like I said, we just went on a road trip and I was working up in um, LA a couple of weeks ago, twice actually in the past couple of weeks, zero change in people's behavior. I could tell you is what I saw. <laughs> Absolutely. And we're talking about a fairly liberal place, a place that you think people would. Mm-hmm. So I, I think what you're seeing is there will always be people that are just like, you know, damn the man kind of thing, like going to not, mm-hmm. not adhere. Uh, but this was like literally every zero people care that there was a stay at home mandate. You know, they're, they're just yeah. doing their normal stuff. And so I think I, I'm guessing that that's a lot of this pandemic fatigue type stuff where you're just like, look, <laughs> it's been, yeah. it's been so long. I just can't, can't handle it anymore. I don't know. Well, my wife and I were talking the other day about how funny, ironic, whatever word you want to use the the fact that everything got shut down and everybody got so serious about this back in like March and April yeah. when the numbers were like a fraction of what they are now, like yep. a small fraction of what they are yep. now. And and now people are just going, yeah, whatever, you know. Right. But I, I think um, part of that might be because like we all know somebody that's had it yeah, at this point. Yeah, I know point. a lot of people. And, and some of them had it pretty bad and a lot of them were just kind of like, I got a headache for a couple of days, you know. Yeah. Um, so I think maybe that's caused us to be a little bit more eh about it because it's like yeah right because because early on it was just like we don't know what this thing is it's a virus we see movies about this you know yeah and and then it's kind of like oh well so and so had it and he just you know was tired for a few days yeah i know a lot of friends that have had it and uh yeah there were no real bad stories at all so yeah it's hard those things add up to not taking it as seriously when there's a whatever you know uh plus you, you have the whole political situation of of especially our governor mandating this and then like just last the week prior being seen at a birthday party indoors at a really fancy restaurant with 40 other people without masks so you're like okay dude i you know it's hard to take someone seriously when they themselves are not abiding by it especially in such a high profile position it's like yeah okay sure buddy you know there's definitely a lot of like <laughs> uh-huh yeah do as i say not as i do kind of thing right but yeah. yeah, I wonder, man. I mean, well, I think masks will be around for a while still, for sure. I do. Yeah, yeah. Did you see the uh, that college basketball player that collapsed the other day? Uh, uh-uh, I saw the headline like earlier this week. I forget where he was playing from, but um, yeah, he he had he got COVID back in like March or April, and um, and was just out playing playing basketball in the middle of a game and just fell on his face. Wow. And and they came around and scooped him up, and I think he had a heart attack or something. Yeah. So yeah. it was like. <laughs> 
Dang. So the, these longer term effects of it, we still don't know. And that's, right. that's, that's also pretty scary. Yeah. Yeah. Some of the sports stuff is really odd to me, man. It's, it's just like in, you know, it, it, as a parent with a kid that should be in kindergarten right now, it's very hard when I see like college sports happening where, where thousands of people rush the field as their team wins <laughs> And I'm going, that's okay, but my five-year-old can't go play on coloring books? Yeah. I don't, like you look, you look at some of these things and you go, how does this add up? You know, I mean, I think they, that's hopefully, – hopefully we can look back at this and, and learn and have sort of a playbook. You know, hopefully the, the Biden administration will, will, at the end of this, or, you know, as this, you know, we come to the close of this, we'll come back and say, okay, so next time, you know, when, when we're all, you know, 100 years from now, whatever, here's exactly what happened and what we should have done now that we know, because it's really hard to know. I think that's where, like, it's kind of hard to fault people for making the wrong decision, like ga these game time decisions. Mm. But once you have all that knowledge, that information, it's like, okay, so now when this happens again, we really should know exactly what's going to work, what's not. I'm afraid that we won't get that, but I don't, I don't think we will. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, 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 I don't know if I consider myself an optimist or not, but I definitely am becoming more skeptical over the human race's ability to learn from its <laughs> mistakes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's one. That's one of the things about getting older that that has 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 bothered me the most is like just seeing the same mistakes happen over and over and over. It's like a minute. It's like Groundhog Day. It's just an endless loop of the things, same things happening over and over again. And after a while, I mean, I can imagine somebody that's in their their eighties is just like I've seen it all. My grandma, my, my grandma, she wasn't going to vote this year because she's like, whatever, you know. She, she's she's mm. like, I've seen it. Like, remember, I, I think we talked about this before, but like when she was a little girl. Hitler was a real live person. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> that was really it, it wasn't it wasn't predetermined that he was going to lose right. that war, right? So now it's just like, oh, this thing's happening whatever. She's totally desensitized to like anything that we can dream up as like the most scary crazy thing. It's like whatever to mm -hmm. to her, you know. Um yeah. so perspective I think gives you a lot. Yeah, and, and Well, I'm heading there fast, let me tell you. <laughs> Uh, cool, man. Well, I think we had one more question come in about China and EVs. So I just want to answer it because we're kind of wrapping up here. This is our last show for the year, I think we mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, from Andrew here about Tesla in China, uh, saying Tesla in China seems like a bigger potential success than it was here. Adoption seems strong. V3 chargers coming online quick, and they are about to produce the Model Y. Could China help propel their growth better than America did? And by their growth, I assume you mean uh, Tesla. Um, I, it's a hard. Yeah, I mean it's a hard one because that factory I think is only slated to be able to produce about 500,000 cars. Maybe now with the new one, but um, you know their their ability to expand there seems to be much easier than their ability to expand to California. I would say. Uh, China is the largest EV market in the world by a long shot. Um, I haven't looked, so I know you're working on that video, Joe. Uh, are, are EV sales up this year or down? Do you know? Worldwide? I don't have that in front of me. Um, okay. Actually, uh, so so I, I did uh, have some research done on that, but the, the video went so long I had to kind of drop it. Yeah, because I know uh, auto sales are down quite a bit this year. In overall, but I don't know mm -hmm. if EV market share is growing or not. What was it like, one point five percent or something last year or something like that? It's still really, really, really small. Uh, actually, I saw three percent. Oh, okay, yeah. Like, so I, I thought it was two point eight percent, but then it said it's up to three percent yeah. this year. So could the, could Tesla in China be a bigger deal than Tesla in the U.S.? Well, not with the Terra factory, because the Terra factory, if <sighs> estimates are correct, could produce something like three to five million cars per year uh yeah i just think it's it's i don't know it'll be a big deal for sure china's the largest ev market uh tesla is a very sought after brand um regardless of the actual number of sales over there it's it's still very much a um you know uh, like a, a sought after thing like a desired product mm -hmm. so i don't think they're gonna lose their luster at all i, I honestly I, i'm the, some of the reviews I've seen of of the Xiaoping P7 and some of the other cars over there, 
I'm really like, I think China's ahead in their technology for EVs, like battery swaps, no big deal, you know? Mm. Like just some of the stuff they're doing because like, like they're so invested in it. I would not be surprised if we see a Chinese automaker like BYD um, or someone like that come to the US and dominate the US auto market, mm. much like Japan did, um, you know? I was about to say. Yeah, yeah. A- after World War II or whatever. So it's one of those things where Tesla in China is going to be a big deal. Tesla's best asset, though, isn't actually the cars. It's the brand. It's that desire, that luster that people have that uh, really is brought on by, by Elon. So I, I, I don't know. I, I think it'd be a big deal, but will it be bigger than the U.S.? Uh, hard to say. Hmm. Yeah. Well, it will be interesting if we start to see those those cars show up over here, because that would be like history repeating itself, like you said, with, uh, well, Japan and Korea. That's right. Well, and yeah. speaking of Korea, uh, the uh, Ionic, I think it is. So Hyundai, mm-hmm. geez, Hyundai spun off Genesis has its own brand, right? So now you have yeah. the Genesis, this, the Genesis, that, whatever. The, I think it's the Ionic one, if I'm correct. They're spinning off as their own EV brand. So it oh, will okay. have multiple Ionic models. The Ionic won't be an individual model. There'll be multiple models. And so they're going to have nothing but EVs. So yeah, I think that's, that's going to cool. be... That's going to be huge. So it wouldn't be surprising at all um, if we saw that. I mean, the the key is manufacturing, really, I believe. that That's the key. Whoever can make the best product for the cheapest whatever. Because if someone's selling, so if Hyundai is selling, uh, you know, this EV that's $10,000 cheaper than this other one, and otherwise it's basically the same car, yeah, I'm going to buy that one. Why would I waste $10,000 <laughs> just to have a certain logo on there? Some people will, right. you know, like like the whole sneaker thing. I never, I don't understand how people spend so much money on that, but people do, you know, there's a market there. So yeah, it's going to be interesting. Yeah. Yep. yep. So you've got that yeah. video coming out. What else do you got? Yep. Uh, well, I mean, Christmas. <laughs> this was the month I was supposed to relax and and I think after maybe today or tomorrow I might actually be able to do that for like three days and then um it's back to the grind but, yep yep yeah I think I've got three more videos coming out this year so we got rid wow. of we got rid of our model X I think we'd mentioned that before so I did a final review with Jenny on that we've got our model we've had our model Y now for uh, seven months or something, eight months. I don't know what it is. So we got a review of that. Uh, probably post that in January, honestly, at this point. Mm. Uh, also the new new car, the new Model S, uh, which I don't know if I told you this, but I'm right now it's in the shop because I'm getting MCU two and full self driving and one other thing. Yeah, the so so a lot of the used Model S's, if it says full self driving capable, that means that they will actually install the hardware three and enable the full self driving capability. Uh, without ha- you having to pay anything extra, so it's mm. actually kind of neat that you can get that um, for essentially a you know a big discount or free or whatever. So I have I have those two things. Oh, and then there was a scratch on the back bumper uh, that they're replacing. So it's kind of a cool thing that that uh, how they're doing it now. They won't send you pictures of the car before. You cannot see the car before. They don't do it. But then when you get the car, they you and you go through you go around it with the delivery person and they mark off things that they're going to then fix. So mine on the bumper, mm. it had this like really deep scratch for like literally like 14 inches, almost like they backed into a garage door and it like tried to come <laughs> up and it scraped it or something. And so, yeah, they're like, cool. So we'll, so you go around the car and there, there weren't a lot. There were just a couple little things. We marked them all and then I gave it over to the service center the next day and then now it's in the body shop or whatever. So in the end, it'll be like a brand new car, but they don't let you see... Uh, they don't let you see it in advance. So I, I want to share that experience because I thought that was a kind of an interesting mm. way of doing it. But apparently having the pictures is, you know, it takes time for people to take pictures of these things and to upload them. And, you know what I mean? It's just, it's a, it's another little tweak of the process to try to mm. reduce and become more efficient. So yeah. Yeah. Got a lot of stuff coming out on that. And of course okay. the EV recap, the state of EVs, as I like to call it, right? The where are we at? How far we've come? Big things that happened this year. Where are we where are we at going into next year? Next year's going to be bananas for EVs. I'm excited to see what what you came up with for that video. It's just a lot of cars. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, Tim has what he's been working on, right? That we're gonna. 
pop in here? I think so. Tim, take it away. So what am I working on next? Well, obviously getting home is one of those things that I'm working on next. Um, I'm still trying to, we're debating, so the whole, okay, you guys know I've been working on the Soviet rocket video forever. It's literally done. We even shot little tiny bits of it down in Boca Chica that we're fitting, you know, to shoot in front of hardware and stuff. Um, but it is one of those things that I want it. It just has to be done right. And there's no, it's so evergreen that it's like being done right, being done uh absolute top quality is what matters to me most. So we might even try to slip one or two more in before that, because one of them's easy. One of them's the Astro Awards. Each year I do a, a video uh, arounding like, you know, here's what was cool and exciting and, and kind of giving a mini awards show for things that I looked forward to in uh, in 2020 or, you know, things that were significant in 2020. I always try to release that on January 1st. So I'll have to see if I can squeeze that in here. Um, but the other video that I think I want to do next um, would be kind of the final part of like SLS versus Starship. Now that SLS has been more delayed, uh, surpri no surprise there. And as Starship continues to actually make some progress, um, the part three would actually be what could physically replace SLS and what could physically replace Orion. Like what options are there actually? Could we put Orion on a Delta IV Heavy or a Falcon Heavy or a, you know, a Falcon 9. Like, what options are there to actually get humans out to the moon? It's way more complicated than it sounds. It seems like, oh, just stick it on this rocket and then maybe dock with another upper stage. It's actually really hard to get something of that mass or even anything out to the moon. So um, that's going to be a really fun video. We're going to do a lot of uh, simulation data and just a whole big old chart of, like, what are our options? You know, what if we stick, what if we try to make SLS cheaper by putting Falcon Heavy boosters, uh, four of them, instead of two, you know, two SLS boosters, stuff like that. It's going to be really fun. It's kind of going to be a, a giant why don't they just episode, and I think it'll be really, really fun. So those are the things I might work on next, and then finally shoot the Soviet engine video, which I'm just not even looking forward to shooting because it's going to be like an hour and a half long, <laughs> which means I'm going to be recording for like four hours. So yay me, but uh, I guess that's the that's the shelf that I put myself. I don't know how to. I don't know. Wow, I can't believe he's doing that. <laughs> wow, that's a yeah, that's another. I didn't think Tim had it in him. He's actually going to Mars. That's unbelievable. Oh. <laughs> Call All right, Joe. Show, well, man. I've I've enjoyed 2020 seeing your face every week and hearing your lovely have voice. You yeah, I have. I missed you last <laughs> week. Was, uh, uh, I'll miss you well, the next couple weeks. Yeah, yeah, same here. Um, I, 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 my one of my bigger disappointments from 2020 is that like, um, we were starting to do some live stuff and we were mm. getting together and we were like taking it outside of YouTube and, and then uh, all that got the kibosh put on it. So I'm, I'm hoping that maybe by the end of next year, we can be doing stuff like that again. Yeah, I think, so. I think there's something right. I fully charged live. I don't think is going to happen in April in, in Texas. Yeah. But I know they're doing the in UK June, one. They have their, their one in, in the UK, but it's, it's going to be outdoors. I think I'm going to that. I want to go to that. I would like to go to that. Because I want to spend all summer in Spain next year. So <laughs> that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to convince the wife on that one. So, yeah, because the, the one-year thing we did out here was awesome. And we totally missed mm -hmm. our, our two-year anniversary. So, yeah, yeah. Hopefully next year, you know, that'll be something that we get back to. I would like that. Well, well uh, uh, for, for everybody listening and watching, thanks for supporting us this year. And um, we'll, we're going to keep this train going as, as long as... Uh, as long as Tim is still around anyway. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, hope you hope you all have a good holiday. Yeah, happy Christmas holidays, or whatever everyone. it is you are celebrating. And we'll see you in... Our Ludicrous 2021. Which it will be. Hey guys, thanks so much for watching and for listening. We really do appreciate it. We couldn't do it without you. Yeah, and if you want more of us, you can consider becoming a Patreon member where you can get early access to episodes. You can listen to us record live, join our awesome Discord community, or get your name in the show credits. So head over to olfpod.com slash Patreon to learn more. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.